Welcome back, everybody, to another Ask the Expert live Q&A with uh, myself, Joe Evers, the fence expert. We've got Mr. Fence, Sean King, here with us as well. Sean, let's thank you be, so much. Let's just be clear. You're the expert, and I'm just the guy on the other end of the camera. <laughs> Incorrect. Incorrect. Now, we're asking you, the expert. Ah, <laughs> uh, no. Yeah, well, I mean, agree to disagree here, Sean, because so the, the video going up today after this after we get done with our live, is uh, is going to be the video we shot with the equalizer tool. Uh, okay, version so one. At version one, version one. That's right. And so <laughs> here in a little bit, we'll watch it because I want everyone here to to understand that my version is not necessarily like the Mister Fence Tools version <laughs> on how to use it. Uh, so Sean and I, I video chatted uh, or video chat. Where did that? I Facetime. How is that? Facetime. Yeah, Facetime, Sean. After after we just after we got done shooting. Now hindsight being twenty twenty, should have done it beforehand. Should have done it beforehand. Well, and I don't I don't know what I was thinking because I was there in Nashville when you showed everyone this is how you use it. I was like, yep, yep, that makes sense. Okay. And then when we shot the video, I did it completely different. And you're like, oh, uh, no, 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 you don't actually do that. So I'm like, oh, you know what? That's right. That's right. And That's now okay. the end result was. Similar and for for demonstration, well, your, for yeah. the video it worked okay, but yeah. but that also leaves room for version two point oh. That's right, the That's correct right. way of doing it. <laughs> Coming but soon. Where I was going with that though, Sean, is as I use more of your tools, more of the the tools you guys put out. Like it, it is very clear that you are an expert in what you do. Just and because tools. The tools make so much sense. Yeah, true. I'll give you that. I am a fence geek when it comes to tools. Now, now, Sean, it doesn't look like you're coming to us from the Mr. Fence studio there. So last time I was on this show, I was in the same hotel. <laughs> <laughs> so Jacksonville, Florida again. Nice. Uh, so it's uh, we, we like this place. It's the Courtyard Marriott down here. Oh, right yeah. on the beach. I keep looking out here. So because I'm looking at the beach, I'm distracted. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I tried. I was thinking. I thought about doing this uh, outside by the pool, but I thought that might be hard for audio and video. And, yeah, you know, things things going by to look better than me in the picture yeah. might get your attention. <laughs> Lots of distractions. <laughs> Lots of distractions. So, so here we are in the room. So yeah. I have a, I have a window too. I, I yeah. don't want you to think you're the only one that has a window. Okay. But, but out my window, I'm seeing rainy trees. Like rain coming uh, down yeah. trees and over again. My view, not quite as nice as Mr. Fence today. This is good. This is good. I'm happy. So this being said, I catch a flight at, uh, I, well, I got to leave here at 125. Yep. Right 1225 so, our time. You got right. it. That's you got right. it. So let's, let's do this, Sean. Let's, let's say we've got a hard out for you at 1215. That cool. way, get you on your way and. And I, because I don't want to be the reason, Mr. Fence. Well, yeah. now I'm not going to complain if we happen to get stuck here for another day. You know, it's oh well, sure, it's oh, sure. okay. Uh -huh. I'm sure, there are we've got worst a flight out. in the world. There are our worst things in the world. We'll be fine. But I, I think I, we do got to catch a flight on Monday though to Dallas. So I gotta be sure I'm back at least by tomorrow. Got to be, got to be back home by tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> well, I tell you what. So Roger Bittencourt's with us. And I don't know why he showed me his earlier. So he was like half an hour early for this. He's like, am I the first one again? Yes, Roger, you are. Thank you so much. And then he said, hello, James. He's welcome to me, everybody. And the reason I bring up Roger, Roger is the king of keeping me on schedule. Now, I've never actually met Roger in person, but every time I say I've got a heart out, Roger's there in the chat reminding me. So, Roger, 1215 Central Standard Time. Sean's got to get out of here. Thank you, Roger. James says, hey, Roger, how's your fence world? James Blaisdell, welcome, welcome, welcome. Dylan Blanc, we know this guy. He's a fence prince. Fence prince. Checking in for the fence king. You got it. We got fence royalty here. <laughs> Hello, Roger. Hello, Roger. Roger's here every week. I just very supportive fellow, and I appreciate that. 
John Hyde says, what can I attach to the top of my T-post fence to attach the top wire of a field fence wire to? Because all the T-posts are driven down below the top wire. John, I'll be honest with you. You're asking the wrong guy. So, wrong guys. Wrong guys. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I didn't know if you guys did ag fence or not. We don't. No. It's just not. In our area, there's not a lot of call for it. So... If someone in the chat has a great idea on how to handle uh, attaching a top wire to a T post, let us know. We can all learn together. I mean, it, it sounds like he overdrove the post and wants some type of connection to keep the wire pulled down. Yep. I mean, you've got the wire connections, but I, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I'm not yeah. sure how you fix that. Short of bringing that post up, which would probably it's be where I would be at. Yep. Mm -hmm. Cannon Johnson's with us. My Let's man. Right. Let's go right. Jim Beck, welcome, welcome, welcome. I want to use Postmaster Plus sold at Home Depot. I want my fence to be six foot tall. Home Depot only sells seven, seven and a half foot tall Postmasters. My question is if it's only 18 inches deep enough of a hole. So here's. Well, it would actually be 24 point. inches deep. Right. So, well, and it depends on your top spacing. Now, and so you've got two different guys right now that use two different reveals up top. That's right. Right. So, Sean, what what reveal do you guys use? We use a seven. Yeah. yeah. So seven inches from the top of the picket to the top of the top rail. Right. It puts the fence one inch off the ground and then uh, leaves you with an extra six inches of post in the ground that you need. So. Perfect. Yep. Absolutely. So the reason they sell seven and a half. Well, there's a few reasons. <laughs> one reason is shipping uh, because uh, eight feet or above is significantly more expensive to ship. Uh, we're finding this out when we're trying to distribute these postmaster posts. Uh, eight foot or more gets fairly expensive. So yep. seven and a half feet keeps them well under that margin. Um, but yeah, so you can drive it or set it, whatever, two foot deep. And then, so we use a six inch reveal, six inch, seven inch. It's all, it's, it's splitting. Yeah. Uh, but that lets you put it two foot in the ground and still get up to the top of that top rail. Mm -hmm. But that, that question comes up quite a lot, Jim. I appreciate you asking it, for sure. Now, we've got some guys that have, I don't know if he has access to it, but we've got some guys that have welded. So they're buying eight-footers, cutting two-foot off, welding the two-foot on the bottom of the eight, and they're a ten-foot pole. Because uh, if you're driving them, we need to be substantially deep, deeper than two-foot. So. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great question, Jim. Appreciate you starting us off with fence content. Justin Hampton, go to the pool. <laughs> All right. I was... I was just at the pool and came up here with my drink for this. Sipping sip it on a Mai Tai. Yeah. <laughs> Chris Steele from High Steel Fence. Hi, Fence fam. I can't I can't watch, but I wanted to stop and say hello. He's at Disney World right now. Disney World? Yeah. That's yeah. one of my favorite places to be. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he is. That's no lie. I love Disney World. And we, we try to go about once a year. So here's a trick. If you like going to Disney World, uh, November is one of the cheapest months in the year to go to Disney World. My daughter's birthday is November 25th. Perfect. So, works out pretty well. What's up, Joe and Sean? What is up, James? Hey, James. You? All right. J Roger is on top of the hard out. 1215. Good deal. Now, James, I'll go back. And say, James came yeah. down to uh, help us with the fence install. Oh yeah, uh, for the, uh, let's talk about that for a second. How'd that go? That was, that was really cool. Uh, young boy, uh, autistic, um, but uh, excellent, excellent little boy. And we put in uh, some wood privacy fence, and uh, we had several companies down there working together to put that in. So some guys, uh, a couple guys, were really brand new to fence, uh, and several had lots of years of experience. Experience. Nice. So it was a training event in some regards, as well as yeah. a community improvement event. Yep. Some might call that a twofer. So actually, Stain and Seal experts, Caleb and then Hunter Offit, my local stain guy, yep. are teaming up to stain that fence. I'm pretty sure this week coming up for the same day. So good for them. I like to hear that a lot. I like to hear that a lot. You know, Sean, your one of your big sayings is uh, what is, plus one. You got a lot hey, of things, but one of them I, I, is. Take care of your team plus one. I mean, like, take care of your village, your people, so no one else has to. Yep. And then take care of one more because someone else is probably falling short to take care of their team. 
If we all do that, we're going to pick up the slack. It'll make a big difference. That's right. That's right. I like that a lot, Sean. I like that. All right. Yep. So Roger's on the hard out. George Castillo's is George from Georgia checking in. Hello, everyone. Welcome, George. George from Georgia. George from Georgia. That'll be easy to remember. Billy Gross from Pensacola, Florida. Billy's fencing. Welcome, Billy. I tell you what, Texas and Florida are, are probably the most represented states like in the chat consistently week in and week out. Sure. As a Missouri guy, I, I'm not a fan of that. I'm like, I am a fan of people being here. Don't get me wrong. But <laughs> we need more hometown representation. Jim Beck says, excellent. Thank you. Jim, thank you. James Blaisdell says, blew my mind what I learned from Sean. I'm a I'm a 20-year veteran. I highly commend Mr. Fence Academy. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. you, Charlie. Yeah, I think I think a lot of people shared James' sentiment after you know the fencing school you put on in Nashville. Um, gosh, that's been been four months, three months, four months, something like that. A little bit ago. Uh, yeah, I think. I think you're right, James. I think just, he good. came with a he came with an open mind and walked away with a few golden nuggets. So, That's right. And really, yeah. you know, when you go to one of those events, it's like drinking from a fire hose. It really is. There's just so much content to try to absorb that you're right. If if you leave with two or three golden nuggets, it's worth it. That's a win. It's, yep. it's absolutely a win. So, guys, uh, if you got questions for myself or for Sean, drop them in the chat below. The conversation I want to have with Sean today is about scaling scaling your business. And a little backstory. Here's how this conversation came to fruition. Um, I believe it was last week, week and a half ago or so. Uh, I called Sean. I was like, hey, I need to have you back on. And, and of course, Sean being the guy he is, he's like, okay. Like, well, let me tell you what we're going to talk about. Let me tell you. I said, here's what's on my mind is our business right now is to the point of we, we need to scale, right? We're, we're kind of bumping up on the ceiling of where we're at. We need to scale our business, right? And so I said, rather than rather than hiring Sean, because Sean does consultations as well. So rather than hiring Sean, having them out, I figured I would ask the questions that I would, that I would ask during consultation. But you guys at home can be a part of the conversation as well. So, well, this type of conversation you don't have to hire me for. Like this is, I help every. Together we get better. So if you want to call me up and have these conversations, that's it. But do you know what? Yeah. We we might charge you for coming on site for spending days yeah. with you, that type of thing. Yeah. But yeah, I'm here to help. Together we get better, man. Well, that absolutely, and that's your giving heart. I really, I really do appreciate that. Oh, we got a Missouri guy, so I got to stop what there we're doing. Go. Nathan Fry from Kansas City. You always connect fences to neighbors. Or run right next to their fence, especially if it's wood to a neighbor's vinyl or aluminum fence. What do you say, Sean? Uh, do you always connect? I hit, always is not a word I'd use. Right. But I would say we almost never connect to the neighbor's fence. So we're the opposite of that. Like it would be extremely rare for me to ever connect anything we build to a neighbor's fence. Generally, if the home buyer asks me to, I'll still set a post about a foot offset. Can't leave it the rails uh, and just almost touch the fence. If it's yep. in wood, if it's aluminum, we'll try to set that post as close as possible. I know we run to that footer sometimes down there. Yep. Uh, and then that sometimes we'll chop away. I'd rather chop away at the footer, put new, the post side by side, then attach, attach it to it. I don't, I don't know. It's, uh, it's a catch-22. If you attach to it, you can get some trouble. The neighbor could get upset. That's You're also now relying on the neighbor's fence. If it falls over, their footer ain't good. It's on you. So That's right. I don't know. And and that answer might vary state to state too, depending on like what the particular like what the specifics are legally is yeah. you know, attaching to neighbor's fence. Uh, here in the state of Missouri, once you attach their fence, now you do have some you know burden on repairing that fence should it should it go down because since you've attached to it, you're claiming partial responsibility for it. So we're we're the same way, Sean. We'll set a post as close to that fence and on, we do predominantly wood fence. So we'll run our fence right, cantilever the rail past the post yep. and put yep. it right. So from the outside, it looks attached. So you when you cantilever that post on a postmaster, you flip that post around backwards? Yeah, we do. We do. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, I put it, them all that way. So <laughs> I know, I know, I know. And that's, yeah, we do. We do. Uh, in that instance. So, yeah, so to answer your question, yeah, we'll run it right next to their fence. Um, and, and we'll do that regardless if it's wood next to vinyl or aluminum. I mean, that's yeah. just kind of what we'll do. 
Um, attaching to a neighbor's fence is kind of, it, it's almost not worth it. You know, the risk reward conversation there, there's not a lot of reward and there's quite a bit of risk. Um, so yeah, great question from a fellow Missourian. John says, can I use Postmaster Fence Post to build a gate? If so, how? Yes, absolutely. So Sean actually did a video on this uh, in one of the Facebook groups. Um, what, what was that, Sean? What, it, it was in so your Facebook group, right? We were experimenting with a different idea, and that was uh, taking two Postmasters Plus yep. and a two-by-six between them, and marry, uh, or, uh, marry, two two-by-sixes, sorry, create a six-by-six six post. So we had two Postmaster Plus turned around backwards, and then a two by six, 90 degrees to each one of those, creating a box. So you created a uh, six by six box that had wood that you could tie your hardware to. And then it gave you strength because the strongest way of that six by that uh, Postmaster is across the four and a half inch area, not the inch and a half, right? So traditionally the way you put them in defense flexes, and that would be bad on a gate. So by turning them the opposite direction, you get really good rigidity when the gates open, right? And then when it gets closed, you have rigidity because of the sections attached to the post. Yep. However, turning it sideways like that, if it's driven, I wonder if that would slice through the dirt and cause a cavity over time because it's very narrow. It's an inch and a half surface yeah. that's sitting on the dirt. Yeah. So if it's set in concrete, um, it probably wouldn't have as much trouble with it. So so turning it sideways is one idea I think would work very well. And the other idea is to double it up with a two by six or two by four between them. Just try experiment. That's we don't it. do much of it. so. Yeah. It, well, so when we do... Okay, each of their own, right? Our way of doing it is we'll set a we'll set a two inch forty or two and a half inch forty weight post, and then uh, we'll use. So there's an outfit called Forney Fence out of Texas. Uh, they have a shark hinge and a shark latch that directly bolt onto a two and a half inch post. Think uh, think 180 degree hinge and how how it attaches. Uh, and, and so we'll use those. So we use forty weight two and a half. Now the drawback to this, and I absolutely understand it, is that you do see the post. So, you know, in a fence where, you know, fence system where we're touting the ability to hide posts, you know, with the postmaster yeah. post, seeing the gate post is a little bit of a disconnect there. Uh, but, but it's a system that works, yeah. this, you know, so I don't know. You can only change so many things at the same time. Um, so we've got gates kind of dialed in where we like it as far as serviceability. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Roger says, Joe, Sean, Mark are all amazing for encouragement and education. Well, we we all have kind of the same motivation, and that is to to rise the tide that is the fencing industry, right? A rising tide raises all the ships. So if we can help elevate the industry through education and the sharing of experience, then I think we're all better for it. I think the industry has always been driven to do that. I think that yeah. the difference is now technology is significantly different than it was when my dad was running the company yes. 25 years ago. Yeah. And so now we're able to get social media content or uh, educational content out really quick and easy. I mean, with your cell phone. So I think we're, we're raising the bar professionalism sure, drastically right now in the past, I don't know, a year or two, two years. I think yeah. we're making huge, huge gains. Agreed. So it's not nothing new. We've always tried. Everyone in our industry yeah. has tried to make our industry more professional, but I think we're making leaps and bounds now because of, well, digital content. Yeah. We're using technology to scale that content. Yeah. You yeah. know, it, it used, you know, 10 years ago, there was educational opportunities, but it was typically once or twice a year. It was yeah. at a fence tech or it was at another, you know, on-site training event in school. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. 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 So, I mean, this has been around, but we're just, we're kind of the early adopters of technology using technology to bring that, you know, at a more scalable rate. Hey, the fry, you're very welcome. Appreciate you tuning in. So James, this is the question. In scaling out, I'm at a point where I need to hire personnel in more of an indirect labor position to help with my responsibilities. What roles would you recommend to start that, start to start that position with? Um, so yeah, picking that one spot's probably hard, right? Figuring out, okay, so is it administrative? Is it sales or is it production? Those, those are kind of, Sean, would you say those are the three kind of main areas that are indirect labor? Three. Sales, administration, and production management. Yeah, yeah, produ yeah production management, yeah. 
Yeah. And so James and I have briefly talked about this uh, yeah. recently because he is in that position. Uh, with what's next, right? So yep. you have, uh, the way I see it is you have owner operators that have done a fantastic job of, of being a fence ninja or a fence artist or They're a crap. craftsman. Yeah. In their business. And, and they, they can keep doing that for a long time. And, and that's great. We need them in our industry because those are the guys that are really like really good, right? Yeah. Top notch. And then we've got larger companies that have multiplied themselves multiple times over. And there's a give and take. Yeah, they're doing a huge, I mean, a whole lot more in volume, um, but maybe not as technical, maybe not as artistic, maybe not as crass, not as high quality sometimes. Okay? Sure. So mass production, sometimes quality comes down a little bit. Look at things that are handmade and things that are mass produced. Yeah. Two different qualities. Do they both work? Well, yeah. Uh, oftentimes, you know, we buy Levi jeans and a designer pair of jeans. And they work just fine, right? Yep. So we got to keep that in context. Um, so, but I find that oftentimes guys that have this question are an owner operator that are at a point where they're like, done building the fence. Like I'm tired of getting up every morning, getting in my truck, going to get material, driving to the job site, digging the holes, and it's all on me. What's next? How do I go past that? And the thing that I tell everyone to do that took me a long time to figure out, probably longer than most, is to get out of the driver's seat. Get out of the driver's seat, which means you have to put somebody else in the driver's seat, right. which means that's the next piece. Who's going to drive the car? Sure. Um, so oftentimes, I think that the best spot is somewhere a production management piece rather than a sales, because as a, as a craftsman, as an owner operator, you're the best salesman you can find, period. Yeah. You know it inside and out. Mm -hmm. And the administration data is something that can be handled with somebody. Uh, you got to have the production first before you even have the data to manage or the dollars to manage, right? Yep. So I, I'm just going to limb here and I'm guessing I think your best bet is be some sort of person to drive the car, project coordinator spot, somebody to handle the day to day operations, and make sure that every opportunity you have, because it's key, we only have so many opportunities to make money. Make sure every opportunity you have, you're making the money, the, the dollars the profit that you need to be making so you can focus on selling the next job and then managing the money right so from that perspective i think it makes sense to look at somebody to help with production sure sure so i'll i'll have a little bit different of a of a perspective i like the administrator i like filling the administrative role pretty soon in the process and when i say administrative role i mean there is a nice polite voice answering the phone within the second ring every time it rings I think that's huge. Yep. I can't tell you how many conversations we have with customers saying, I'm so, thank you for answering your phone. I'm so glad someone was there to talk to me rather than I've been talking to whomever else, but I leave messages and the messages are never returned. And I can't seem to get a hold of the person. I just get a hold of an answering machine. We hear that enough that I understand that that's important, right? That we have someone with a with a nice polite voice answering the phone every time because now can i answer the phone absolutely but sometimes it's nice to have a, a lady answer the phone with a nice sweet voice because sometimes sometimes i have rough days and yeah. i might not be the most polite on the phone right and i and i would completely agree with you on that and you do something i used to do and that is you have an answering service yeah we're, we're and that's what almost everybody can do that pretty inexpensively is hire an answering service to answer your phone full time. And yeah. then you have the live operator answer the phone with the good voice. It is her job is to take all the information down, follows the criteria questions yep. and digitally breaks that down. So, you know, rather than hiring someone full time in the office, you might both just start baby steps because yep. Joe was right. It's very important that you handle the information coming in uh, and, and almost uh, take it off your plate because as owner operators, there's, as entrepreneurs and fence ninjas, we're the worst at handling those phone calls and managing the pieces on post-it notes all over the truck. That's right. That's right. You know, you know? Um, but we're also our own worst enemy with production. And what I mean by that is uh, when we say get out of the driver's seat, the what, we, what we're talking about is the day-to-day -day putting out the fires. As an, as an entrepreneur, as an owner, okay, when something goes awry, it becomes your main priority. It absolutely becomes your priority. It's a fire and you are a the best firefighter in your company and you're going to go put that fire out with whatever resources you can manage 
you'll bring in helicopters and airplanes and you're going to drop bombs on that thing. You're going to put it out. Yeah. But what, what happened while you were focusing on that fire? The next one you didn't prevent because it's getting ready to come and you're going to, you pass the point of no return. It hasn't started yet, but the consequences, things are already laid, uh, started to unfold. That fire's coming. So then you're going to fight that fire. And what happens is there comes the next one. So think about for firefighting, they got to figure it out. These guys got fire extinguishers and fire suppression systems in homes and fire practices, right? We need to do the same thing in our business. What's your fire extinguisher? What's your fire suppression system? Where's your fire department? Who's going to manage that fire? Like think about your business the same way, because if you don't have a plan for to prevent the fires, then you're going to spend all day fighting the fires. And if you're fighting the fires, you're not making money. Yep. Does that make sense? Right. So you got to get out of the driver's seat, stop fighting fires, which means here's the hardest part, Joe. They're like, okay, they get out of the driver's seat for just a second and the thing starts catching on fire. What do they do? Run right back down and let me fix this real quick. All right, I'll handle it. No problem. I'll, me, I'll do it. Here, here's what needs to happen. Let it burn. They're like, what? Let it burn. Mrs. Jones is going to get pissed. Her fence is going to be messed up. The truck's going to get messed up. The crew's going to take three times as long. Whatever the consequence is, yeah. you're paying that consequence because you did not plan prior. It's your fault. And you're trying to you're trying to negate or minimize the consequence, right? By going to fight the fire. If you let it burn and you focus on preventing the next one, think about that for a minute. If I can stop the next one, I'll deal with this burned up house here. If I can stop the next two or three and not catch my breath now and start managing my company from like a remote control, not in a car. You can see things a lot better from remote control than yeah, in the car. Absolutely. So kind of keeping in that same gear, I was watching I was watching a TikTok. Uh, this gentleman who the, the gentleman that, that and I don't know his name, but he's he's very much uh, like a gun safety type guy, very much pro Second Amendment, that sort of thing. Um, but his point was, he goes, listen, he said, all of you have a gun next to the bed because you think that home invasion is your biggest enemy. And it's not home fire. You're more likely to die from a home fire than you are. He's like, teach your children how to become firefighters. And when he said that, I was like. I know somebody else that talks about being a firefighter, <laughs> but, but this is, but it translates, right? Yeah. His point was teach your children to become firefighters and keep fire extinguishers in the bedroom because they can help you fight a fire, right? Yeah. So that you're not one person trying to put out a big fire. You're three or four people trying to put out little fires mm -hmm. and that resonated with me. Let's teach our team to become firefighters. That's right. I'm, I'm guilty of being the head firefighter around here. Right, it's Chief like, firefighter. Every morning, I put on my roller skates and my yeah. firefighter's helmet, and I just skate around trying to put out fires all uh -huh. day, every day. One, exhausting, right? Because I, I am so guilty of coming home, and my wife says, "What, what did you do today? How was your day? Oh, it was good. What did you do? Nothing. I don't know. Um, yeah, I feel like I was really busy all day. I mean, yeah. I'm exhausted." Um, but and I, you talk about what everyone else didn't do and the <laughs> problems you had to deal with. Right. And you're like, right. that's, that's it. I know. Been yeah. there, still there. A uh, head firefighter with roller skates. Like that's how I picture myself is just rolling around here, putting out fires. And, and when I heard him say that, I heard him, I, I watched it a couple nights ago and that's, what's been on my mind ever since is, is turning our team into firefighters. Right. Equip like, them. Well, equip them and train them. So I'll say sure. this. Firefighters are trained. Yeah. Right? Just like leaders should be trained when they're promoted. I'll give you for example. I was in law enforcement for several years, and one of the calls I got was a fire. First person on scene, this was a great big hay, hay, hay barn, very nostalgic place. So always go there, get your Christmas trees. We all know this place, and it is fully engulfed on the top. Okay, I'm the only – I'm way out in the county. First guy there, I, uh, the old lady is running around. She has a tanker truck with the three inch water hose. She's trying to get upstairs. I'm like, oh, I could do that. So I drag it upstairs and she turns it on. I felt like Superman. I turned that thing on and I was like, oh, I got this. And I start spraying everywhere. Untrained, I don't know what I'm doing. I think I can put this fire out. Well, the problem was the power was still on. So as I'm spraying everywhere, I am literally get this hose is vibrating through my arm like a vibration. This feels really, it's starting to hurt. I go of it, I didn't know what it was. And she's screaming, grab, it. I grab the hose again. I'm trying to fight this fire. I'm being electrocuted at some point, whether I'm standing in water, the hose is wet, whatever. I'm literally getting electrocuted as I'm trying to fight this fire. And it was just hurt to hold on to the hose. The fire team probably shows up. They put it out and they, they're laughing at me like, well, I, how would I 
never even crossed my mind to think about a power source. Right, right. You would, but I'm well, not trained. The point is, I'm not trained as a firefighter, and neither yeah. is our team. We're going to help them. And you were focused on the fire. It was you it. weren't paying attention to what was around. Yeah, you got hyper-focused. Yeah. And that's the thing is, you know, even when we look at fire fire districts, the fire district has a chief, right? Like they still have leadership, but everyone is trained to put out fires. Yeah. The chief can put out the fire or the first, the, the guy that is his first week on the job can put out a fire. But you don't see the chief rolling around every single fire, putting them all out. He shows so, the big ones. He shows that, you know. Right. That's true, what, true. That's, that's kind of how I picture this is if I can train other firefighters here, that, I mean, I still show up to the big ones, make sure it gets handled correctly. But if someone has an oven fire, the chief doesn't show up. Yeah. You know what I mean? So That's, they're equipped to fight the fires. They've got the equipment, right? Yeah. Equipped to be knowledge, tools, authority. Authority is a big one. Yep. Like you yep. got to equip your team to handle those things. So, yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, in, in talking about, in talking about answering phones, this this comment is kind of what, where that comes from. James goes on to say, I made the mistake of using my cell phone as my business line. All yep. responsibility starts on that phone. I need to change that. I've not figured out how to do that without a loss in business. James, understand that this is probably like the most common, and, and I don't want to say mistake because it makes sense. Like you have to start somewhere. I need I need a way for someone to call me. I have a phone in my pocket that they can call me on. Like, so it's not a mistake. It's a growing pain. Right. right? That, that yeah. was absolutely the correct solution. For an owner operator that worked great. Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. you can, someone can get a hold of you, whether you're, you know, no matter where you're at on a job, on a sales call, whatever. So it was the correct tool for the job at the time, but now it's just time to, it's, it's time to scale that. So that, tell you that. Yeah. Yeah, I'll tell you that it's a it's a big piece. So and you can take your number and forward it to yeah. a call center. Yeah, and you're better off doing that and get yourself a new personal number. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And and James, the number one question that this call center or whoever whoever you have answered this phone, the number one question is, well, where's James? I'm used to talking to James. I only want yeah. to talk to James. Like, so you got to figure that one out. You know, the correct answer there is, you know, James is a busy guy. He's all right. over the place. So I'm here to try to help you right now rather than have to wait for James to get back with you. Yep. So James, that can be in the in terms of a call center. That can be in terms of I've seen guys do this differently. A call center will be more expensive, but they hit the ground running. Yep. Right. So you could literally with with minimal training, I mean they need to know your business, they need to know how to answer certain common questions. But then on day one, when you forward the phone number, it works. Right. But it's more expensive. You can also, what what, a, what I see a lot of guys do is they bring their significant other into the scene and say, you know, here, your job, enter this phone and, and, you know, make sure it works. Less expensive, but it doesn't necessarily work on day one. Yeah. More problematic, more problematic for sure. Right. That's right. But, but it, you know, it's one of those things. I think the correct answer is the answering service, but I fully comprehend though that it's not the cheapest option, right? right. So that's why I want to, that's why I want to throw a couple ideas out there is just because I don't want you to look at a price tag of a call center and go, "Well, oh, gosh, I could never afford that." So I'm back to me on my cell phone. Like there is there there are different options. So if you're at that very beginning stage, you're not sure about a call service or if you should have someone answering the phones. Maybe you can get somebody in the office who can do multiple uh, duties at first if you're not that large. They can answer the phone. They can do some administration, probably handle some production. Yep. Management pieces. Find yep. a cross-breed person to make the baby steps to get to the next level of bringing in the second person. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, a friend of mine, actually, so he's, he's a good friend of mine. He and I are also partners in some uh, rental properties. He, he recently just did that. So he does home remodeling. But he brought his sister into the fold to answer his phones when they ring because that was a problem, but also do some light production management. Like just I need you to I need to hand you an order and have you just order the materials, right. make sure they show up here on time. Like he still does the heavy lifting, but he has her in an administrative role to do right. all the easier tasks or the more straightforward tasks. Right. Um, but she's there to answer the phone too. So 
Look at that. That was a two for answer. That was a your answer and a my answer coming together. <laughs> this, so James, I get it. I love her, but I can't work for my wife. Understood. Uh, that's how it is here is I love my wife to pieces. And depending on the day, I think she would tell you the same thing. Uh, but she doesn't work here, right? She has, she has in the past, but she stays home with the kiddos and make sure that they're raised the way that we'd like the kiddos to be raised and that sort of thing. So I absolutely understand, James. I get it. Um, I just, I use the example of significant other because I think that's what we see in the industry a lot, right? You see husband and wife yeah. being a lot. Um, or in, in, you know, in the case of my friend, it's him and his sister, right? So and and got, I think that's different when they're really, uh, I've seen some husband and wife teams where the wife is really good. Yeah. Like really good, like really good at doing what she did. And then yeah. I've seen where they're not so good. Sure. And then that's kind of cancer. It's like, okay, hold on. Yeah, we, we need to move past that. Yeah. Uh, you need to look at getting somebody else in that position because one, she's not even good at it and it's causing drama in your, in your world. Yeah. Uh, well, you might, yeah. I, I think it comes down to passion. Right. Right. Is it a passion or is it not? Um, you know, my, my wife, like she did a good job here, but her passion was raising our kids. Yeah. Right. So you, this isn't any different than filling any other position here. If you fill a position with someone that that's not their passion, that's not something they're interested in, it's probably not going to go well, right? Yep. So it's it's the same conversation, you know, no matter what the position is. But you're right. If you if you feel that with if your significant other is not into it, if they're only doing it to help, not good. Not good. Not great. Yeah. So, Canon Canon jumps in. Let's talk about the value of getting stuff out of your head. I love using a notebook, a cheap $2 notebook. I fill it up every day and try to check things off the list. I have done my absolute fair share of that. I remember, remember uh, when I was in that transition period about that one to $1.2 million uh, a year gross revenue. And I had people in the office, I had people in the office, but I still was handling a lot of the management. I had a notebook attached to my windshield of my truck. Everything that happened in my world went on that notebook and I would yeah. skip, flip it every day I don't see anybody with those things anymore, but that was back before the, uh, the smartphones. But I lived by that notebook in that truck yep. every day. Anything, any thought I had, a phone call, something, a note went on that thing while I was barreling down the road or parked, or uh, I'd take the thing inside the house at night and kind of go through it. So I, I, I get it, Ken. It's a good idea. Get it out of your head. Get, get it wrote down. If that's what you need to do. So I, so I'll add to that a little bit. So we use two two pieces of software that before before using that we use notebooks a lot. Like I notebooks and like I've in my drawer I've got notebooks thick of just past year stuff. We started using Trello, T R E L L O to as my like digital notebook. Right. So I can I can put a mind dump into this thing. Get all try to get all the information out of my head because I can add my team to it and now it's accessible from anywhere with an internet connection. Right. How do you get oh, it in there? Cool. Well you guys sit down and type it out. Yeah. <laughs> That's that's the thing. But how do you get it on a notebook? You got to sit down and write it out. Yeah. So it's it's, it's kind a convenience of, thing. As long as, as long as you have access to type it out, as long as the notebook is sitting next to you. Right. Otherwise, right. you're going to have time when the moment strikes. Yep. Yeah. Well, and so that might be that might be a two-stage process then, right? Yeah. The problem I always had with my notebook scenario was it was accessible to me, but it wasn't searchable. Yeah. So for, for me, like I arranged it by day. It was it's kind of like a construction diary. You know, it was by days. And so I'd have to remember when was I, so that, okay, that was last week. So let me flip the last week and yeah. it wasn't searchable. With Trello, I can go in and type in like a key phrase or a keyword and it'll start showing me my entries that are that are by that. It's also how, it's also how we, how we answer questions for like the call center. So our call center, we're in Missouri, but our call center is in Virginia. So is there's, they're not in house. So it's also a place to where if the question comes up more than twice, the question goes into Trello and then I or someone on the team answers it. That way it's the same answer is repeated over and over. Uh, but then I can also search it for me. That, that's how it started was I could also search my answer. Right. Can I you can delegate? Search. Can you delegate things through Trello to team members? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, I, I don't do a lot of Trello entries anymore. So unless it's, a very specific question that needs my specific answer. A lot of times, like my sister Sarah will be, she spends most of the time in there 
with the call center. Candace, who uh, runs our retail, she's in there sometimes as well. Uh, so Candace runs our retail. She's also kind of like our on-site admin. She's in there a lot. Yeah, you can absolutely delegate. You just add your team members to it. And then, you know, so really what I do now is once a month, I'll just kind of pr cruise through there to see what's going on, what, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, now, the thing with Trello is it's more of like, it's a more of a notebook. We also use a program called Slack, which is more real-time communication, right? So it's okay. texting, basically. But you can add a bunch of people to this. And again, it's searchable. So where, where this comes up for us is if we have uh, maybe a customer with a question or war so where we really use this for warranty type stuff. So someone says, hey, I called in three weeks ago, da 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 da, da. Well, one, we go to our warranty board on, on our Google Drive and see if it's there. But then two, we can search the last name. And now we have a whole list of, you know, exactly what, how the conversations went, right. you know, when they called last time. So we're not having to re- you know, relearn all of the, con you know, whatever their problem is or whatever, you know what I mean? Like whatever yeah. conversation went on, it's real. So it's basically a searchable text message at that point. Um, but yeah, Trello, so Canon Trello, I checked that out. I There's a free version. We used a free version for a long time. The only reason we went to a paid version was so that I could add, like we had talked about using Loom a few weeks ago but you can add like just different video content. So I was doing like screen records. Um, why did I have to, do? oh, I know exactly why. So I was, I documented what our check deposit process was. Yep. So we have a digital check processing thing. So it was me just documenting that, but I had to add a video onto Slack and that's when we had to do like a premium version or something like that. Anyway, I say this to say it's free for the for a large part. So we use the app called Crew, C-R-E-W for communication. Yeah. And that thing is amazing uh, for communication rather than texting. It's an alternative to texting. So yeah, it's really like organized. That. I like it too because we've thought you've talked before about uh, you can like put stars on the crew app. You can yep. kind of give feedback. You can that. give feedback, show appreciation to your team, which goes miles. I like that. Uh, but but we have different groups in there. We can manage that, and it goes across platforms. I know that's tough. Android iPhone users, texting is difficult, getting new people in the group, old people out of the group, not, not having the history in the group, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. It allows us to put videos and pictures. Uh, we make our teams do updates um, three times a day in the in the app. So we have a record of the video of what status, where they were at 11, where they were at one, where they were at when they finished. Right. You know, so it helps us tremendously crew. I think they charge for it now. It used to be free, but I think there's a, a fee for it now. Sure. But, but it's probably worth it. You mm -hmm. know, what I mean? it, it, oh, yeah. it's, yeah, I, I would crew definitely check. So if you're watching this and you don't have it, check out crew or Slack one for real time yep. communication. All right. So let's see here. James had another question. So what is the best strategy to broaden your service area to enter into areas within an hour from my location? Many find me from Google search. How do I show up on searches an hour away? I would say talk to Sam Matillo at dot com and that man will make your phone ring like crazy. Yeah, <laughs> I agreed. agreed. Wherever you want to ring. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. We use Google a lot and Google. So we Google is great for intent based searches, right? Someone says, I need a thing now. I'm going to go Google search it. What where we go for brand building for like brand awareness is Facebook. It mm -hmm. still works really well for us. Yep. And you can you can you can define a service area or you can define a ad placement area. And so for us, we wanted to go, we wanted to try a market that it was just a little over an hour from us. Uh, it's down an interstate though, so it was easy to get to. We had we've gone in, into that market before, but we've never really advertised it. So I could run ads specific to that market and just define I want it within a 30 mile radius of the downtown, you know, location of this city, right? Yeah. So I got all of that city, got like the surrounding community, that sort of thing. Uh, and then just basically ran an awareness campaign. Hey, did you know Ozark Fence Service is your area now? We, we specialize in this, this, and this. For more information, give us a call. And then we could kind of track it that way. Uh, but yeah, so for Google, Sam is the man. Yeah. Google 
Sure. So to hit these outside counties that we were in, um, he actually created uh, website pages with that town name in it. So we were like ranked number one in every one of those towns because it had the town name in the page address, Mr. Fence of Boonville, Mr. Fence, uh, you know, Warwick County, you know, Warwick County's premier fence company, Mr. Fence. So he made all these pages and all of a sudden they start popping up like crazy, all those places. Uh, sure. That's a digital piece that Sam can help you with. The yep. other thing, if you want to get into a market away from you, find some way to get a two for branding out of it by getting some content over there. Like for us, uh, we just talked about this last Wednesday, was we drive our vehicles that are lettered up, grown like you you have now, yep. uh, through some of these, through these towns that are an hour away or four or five minutes away. We get calls that day. People saw the vehicle. So having your vehicle branded when you're in the area is huge. Uh, we have that uh, show trailer that we are taking to Owensboro, which is almost an hour away. Finding places to park that and leave it over there. Uh, that's just like a big billboard or sign. So branding, physically branding in the area you want to go to. Get with somebody help with digitally branding as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let me see. So, yeah. So, so Google, go with Sam. You could also try a Facebook thing. So the Facebook would probably be least expensive, but understand Facebook isn't for making your phone ring tomorrow, no. right? It's a, it's a brand awareness. It's not a call to action. All right. So let's see. Mark's in the house in the chat. What is up, Mark? You should be able to make your cell phone number, landline, and vice versa. Worst case scenario, you can update all your website and Google listings with your new number. Mm -hmm. Completely agree. And then you can, you can hand that phone off to someone that their sole mission in life is to take the best care possible of whoever's on the other end of the phone. That's right. All right. Yeah. And then Roger says, Mark's in the house. Hi, Mark. How does this call center work? Do they send you messages electronically? Yes. So, and actually, so the call center is who brought us Slack. Um, that's their preferred communication method uh, to get in touch with us real time. So our process is like at each of our desks, we've got Slack up in the lower right hand corner where we it's kind of like how uh, instant messenger used to be for all of us that mess with AOL instant messenger. So you just have a you have a message window in the lower right and that's just how they communicate. So we have like a there's a general communication tab. There's a management tab. So if the call center manager needs to ask me or my sister a question, but it doesn't really need to go in the general chat. It can go in there. Um, but they also, they deal a lot with like landscapers. So it's not necessarily fence guys in general, but landscapers that have a ton of crews. So they also have like a production channel. They have a whole lot of other channels there too. So, but, yeah. so, so how's the call center work? Yeah, they just ask us via Slack and then they can forward calls to us. So typically what she'll do, so, and I don't know how deep in the weeds to go on this, but so we have the VoIP system, the yep. voice over, voice over IP. Yeah. So, so technically each of our phones has its own like digital phone number. So she could forward calls to us. So staff will say, you know, she'll put in the chat. Hey, Joe, I'm sending you Mark. He wants to chat about the yep. post driver he sent you. So I see that and I, and I, I usually just get the thumbs up emoji and then she forwards it to me and answers the phone like, Hey, Mark, how's it going? Uh, hey, crazy thing about this driver. And so it feels like, so to Mark, from his perspective, feels like she's right up front, right? Yeah. He's like, yep, let me make sure he's in his office. Give me just a second while she's typing all that out, sending it over to me. Um, yeah, so they send us messages electronically, and then, uh, but they can also transfer it to us. We would get emails, and they would type out all the text, and it would be our template, so all the questions that we want them to ask. Yep. So it's in, a, it's in the same order every time I kind of scan through it real quick. Yep. And I would get every single phone call in an email. And um, we were only doing it um, not all day. So we did this answering service from like four all night. So we answered okay. the phone live when we were doing it. It was just to help fill the gap. I don't want answer machines in, in the evening yeah. Yeah. or be dealing with the calls after, after hours. So they would email us those. But they would also uh, forward them straight to my cell phone. If she had, if our call center had something that was hot, it's a problem, like, they could just send the right to me. They'll first call me. Hey, I got so and so on the line. This is what's happening. Okay, for we'll patching through, and yep. then it would seem like they're in the front office because it would come right to my phone. Yep, yep, absolutely. Uh, it's a good solution. It really is. 
Uh, it's not inexpensive though. Like that, I want to stress that because I don't want, I don't want to come off as a guy like giving everyone the high dollar fixes here. Sure. You know what I mean? So for us, they would charge us based on call volume. Okay. And we would have to, and we would have to pick the volume up front that we wanted to pay for. In other words, you, you would buy 300 phone calls. Okay. And then if you exceeded that, they started charging for every phone call exponentially. Right. So you always wanted to buy more, make sure you were above. Yeah. So you didn't get hit like with the extra mileage charge on a lease vehicle. Right. Yeah. So, or, or when your cell phones used to buy the minutes. Right. Something like right. that. Yeah. Okay? Uh, but for us, it wasn't that much money. It was only a couple hundred bucks a month, but we were okay. just, we weren't doing it during the day. Right? Yeah. Right. So we were, we were capturing all the calls after hours and weekends and holidays. Gotcha. 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 Very cool. We're going to start calling Mark this for sure. Great question. Fly guy. Mark Olson is from here for to be called fly guy. Curious about call center two. How's it compared to one full time W two person in terms of cost? So it's the same cost. It really is. Um, we we look at we, when we break down our numbers quarterly. We're looking at that, and that's a conversation we have occasionally. So sometimes it's more expensive than having an in house person. The thing is, so with the call center, we have we have Stephanie that's answering our calls. We also have her supervisor Lori that's overseeing the call volume, overseeing the questions and answers, listening to recordings, that sort of thing. And and Lori Lori's been with us. Lori started out on the phones with us, and then she got, she got promoted to management. So we get we get a couple layers there for roughly the cost of one W two employee. And it takes it off our plate, right? So it is Lori's job, the supervisor's job, to make sure it works flawlessly. I don't have to listen to recordings at the end of the day. I don't have to do all that. So we, that's a conversation we have, though. We could bring this in house for a small savings. Should we do that? And we have right. them in house, and we have their direct team member, that sort of thing. Um, right now, right now, we stick with them being with the, with the offsite just because. Also, I don't have to worry about who's showing up each day to answer the phone, right? That's yeah, that. yeah. That Lori's job. Yep. If Steph, for whatever reason, and this comes up occasionally where Steph has a doctor's appointment or she's got kids, kid stuff comes up, right? So Lori's there. She enters the chat. She says, hey, Steph had to step away for a few hours. I'm here taking over. Yep. Let me know if you need anything. So there, it's their, it's their responsibility to make sure that phone gets answered. Not mine. So a little more expensive, but it takes that burden off me. Yep. So Sean, it's I put it down below. Yeah, it's I put it three two three messages below. Bingo. Never mind. I should pay more attention to the chat. Understood. Billy Grove says I'm highly considering a name change come renewal time next year. What would be the best way to make the transition, but not confuse people as a new fence company? So but we did that. You know, we used to be Dossett and Sons. Yep. And what, what I did in early 2000s was I said, Dossett, or, uh, uh, Dossett and Sons, home of Mr. Fence. Yep. Did that for a few years and then transitioned to Mr. Fence. Or you see brands through the formerly known as, yeah, right, or a division of. So you see brands do that sometimes. They'll roll out a new name, a division of the known name, and then one day the known name just disappears, and it's only the the new name, and they drop a division of totally. So that's kind of a a transition. So so, but Billy, you said come renewal time next year. What are Shot I, I hope it's not a, I hope it's not a yellow pages. Yeah. Yep. 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 That's kind of where my mind went. I was like, what are we renewing here, Billy? Let's talk about that. Um, but yeah, no, you could do uh, formerly known as home of a division of that sort of thing um, mm -hmm. just to, and you could use that for a year or two just to get people used to seeing that name, seeing that branding. Now I like using branding that is very similar. So we started a staining and sealing division of Ozark Fence. So, but we're like Ozark Fence doesn't make sense. So one of one of part of the staining and sealing, the cleaning company is, 
we'll come clean your driveway, clean your house, clean your roof, because it's the same equipment as cleaning your fence. If I have to invest in that equipment, that equipment's going to make money, however it can. That's right. I'm not going to be the guy's like, oh, I don't clean your house. I just clean your fence. Hey, if we're there and I got the machine, yeah. I'll clean your gutters if you'll pay me. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like, why not? But that yeah. didn't make sense, though, to talk to call a fence company to wash your house. Like, those two things don't seem similar. So we created Ozark Clean and Seal. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that, that makes more sense to call a cleaning company to clean your house. But Ozark Clean and Seal never existed. Now, we called it Ozark, obviously, because Ozark Fence is a nice name in our market. And I bet it's still orange. So that's exactly right. So our sign is a black sign with orange lettering. See? Ozark Clean and Seal is a orange sign with black lettering. It's the okay. exact inverse. So that someone looks at it goes, oh, okay. Ozark, Ozark, inverted colors, same company. It's right? amazing what color branding will do. It is so, so crazy. It people people bring me things now just because it's orange because yeah. they know I like orange stuff. So I don't even know an example. Like it's just so I don't have a cup up here, but one of my buddies brought me a ar an orange Arctic cup. It's got Punisher on it, and it, he's like, "Hey, I saw this. It was in a store. It was orange. I know you like orange. Here's your cup." Okay, okay. it's made such an impact that I love orange that people just correlate me with that i got that from a buddy whose family has been doing this for generations they're yellow all anything yellow ask them why they like yellow i don't know that's how dad did it dad just decided yeah. one day now dad has a felt cowboy hat that yellow. Is yellow yellow crocs yellow jacket like this wow. is where the home shows he kills it right and and they are known as the yellow family everyone yeah. just loves yellow they don't love yellow, <laughs> you know what I mean? But they're known as that. Color branding is absolutely incredible as far as living rent-free in the back of somebody's mind. Like as a marketer, that's what you want. You want that's to right. live in the back of their mind rent-free, waiting for that day they need to recall. And then there you are. So true. Fishing and picking is with us. Welcome back. So your competitors can blow up your call center budget, kind of like Google Ads back in the day. Um, if you buy by the minute of the call, could be. Um, uh, we but you're not doing that. No, we just pay yeah. we just pay a flat fee. Yeah. And it was years ago out. when I did it, guys. Years ago, probably ten yeah. years ago when I was doing it. Well, and that's but that was that was the common, you know, charge method or method of payment, you know, at that time too. So yeah. No, for right now, my my competitors can call all they want to. That's fine. We just yeah. pay a flat fee and tell them I said hi. That's right. Hey, what what can we do for you? I got a full line of fittings. You That's need right. you, you let you me know. Some? Yeah. Come on over. You bet. I got some stain I can sell you. There you go. Exactly. All right. So Sean dropped in the chat. James, uh James. So that is wrong. That is wrong. So about uh two more down. I fixed it. Gotcha. There you go. That Dot is correct. Globalmedia.com. There you go. Sam is an incredible human being. I like Sam a lot. I only got to chat with him for like a day when I was I was at your event, and uh, man, what a guy! Yeah, like he he Love is he is very public about his nerdiness. He loves to nerd <laughs> out on all things Google, which I appreciate a lot. All right, so Ken says if it's similar, that's fair. They do one job. Yeah, that's right. They do one job. They answer the phones and they route phone calls for us. Well, I say that, so they can do other things as well. And so during the winter time when the call volume slacks, we, I mean, we have, we pay a flat fee to have her available. So in the way the fee were, they have a few different levels. So we share her with another company just because yeah. our phones don't ring full time. Like they ring, but anyway, um, but in the winter time when the phone's not ringing, we have her do like, she can go through basically any task, any task a virtual assistant can do. She can, do. I mean, wow. that's essentially what she is. I mean, her, her job one is answer the phones. Make sure you, we've got a great voice on the other end of the phones. It's very sweet. Answer all the questions. Job one. But if that's not happening, we've got a few other things you can do as well. And uh, she loves it. So she's all, she's basically a virtual assistant that specializes in answering phones. If that makes sense. Uh, oh, 
okay. So Billy was saying he's renewing his LLC and insurance. That makes more okay. sense. Gotcha. All right. Yeah, I would do. Oh, I like this. So they're dark blue and black for LEO support. Oh, the boy. I love it. I love it. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. So one thing to think about is, so if it's black with blue lettering, just like what we did, you could invert the colors. You could do blue sign with black lettering. Still yeah. accomplishes the same theme, right? Still shows support. But, you know, you could say a division of or formerly known as or home of mm -hmm. your new brand. So I like that a lot. I like it a lot. So, Sean, let's talk about, let me, let me keep an eye on. Okay, we've got you for another hour. Now, I also need to put back in my mind, we need to watch this video. So, I'm oh, yeah, on my mind too. Okay. Um, so, let me, Sean and I have talked about our scenario as far as the company, but I want to share it with you guys just so you kind of know where we're at right now. Um, so, we're, we're a small to mid sized fence company uh, on the smaller side of medium, if that makes sense. I think we do, we do a couple million, two, two, five a year is what our goal is this year. So there are a lot of fence companies to do a lot more fence out there. Um, but we're, so we're kind of like, I've always said, we're kind of in the Goldilocks zone, right? Not too small, not too big, comfortable in the middle. Uh, the problem is the middle moves, right? Is we, we need to keep scaling so that we can take care of our customers so that we can continue and so that we can have more of an impact, right? Mm -hmm. To your point, take care of your tribe plus one, well, if we can make our tribe bigger, we can take care of more people. Sure. Right? So we we have. Let me. So we we employ both contractors and in-house production, depending on the commercial side. The commercial guys they like to be subcontract. They like to claim their trucks and tools on taxes. Perfectly fine. Residential. We those guys work in-house because also when you view it from the perspective of the client, the commercial client isn't concerned with who's putting the thing up. They're concerned with results. I want this thing by this date and I want it to meet these standards. I don't care if you if you have Martians come in and install it. That doesn't matter to me at all. I just want it done. Residential, on the other hand, is very concerned with who's in their yard. Rightly so. Like I get it. If I if my wife and kids are at home, I want to know who's working in my yard. Yep. So those guys work in house. So we've got a couple crews that do in house production, do residential. We've got two, sometimes three crews. And I say that uh, on subcontract. One of the crews is a family crew. So it's a dad and his two sons, but they can also bring in an uncle. They can also bring in nephews and they can grow into from one crew into two or right. possibly. We've had them grow into three before on, on a really large project. Um, so that's our production staff. And then we've got three guys in our fabrication shop. So one guy's full-time fabrication. One guy, this is as we're growing into our new spot, one guy is purely inventory. So it's keeping track of all of our fittings, keeping track, and he helps. He's also a support role as well. Uh, and then we've got one guy that's purely in the yard, meaning that he loads and unloads trucks. He's running the forklift. His, his job seat is that forklift chair, right? Right. So, We've got those guys, and each one of those kind of supports each other, of course. But the fabricator, he's been with us forever. He's like the supervisor out there in the yard. In the office, uh, we've got my sister, Sarah. She runs our residential. Now, we still, we, we're still using the habits that we, that we grew from, right? Meaning that, so my sister, Sarah, she sells the job. Well, she'll, she'll pre-approve or she'll pre-qualify the job, have a phone conversation, go out there after the contracts and deposits received. She does a project management as well. And she also, she follows it from lead to it's done. Yep. Like it's her baby all the way through on the residential side. My dad does the same on the commercial side. He follows it all the way from lead to that job is done and everywhere in between. Um, we've got Candace up front. She runs the retail sales. So like our uh, point of sale system, that sort of thing. She also does administrative she scans things for my dad and emails it just because he doesn't want to learn to do that. He doesn't care to learn, and that's absolutely okay. Right. Uh, she's she's his technology assistant, really, uh, is what what she is. Uh, and then I do, and then I'm a firefighter on roller skates. Uh, I talked about before. 
I also do like our billing, accounts receivable, payable, really payroll, that sort of thing. Yeah, it's um, and it's pretty straightforward. So we use the CRM we use makes it pretty easy. Really, when I say accounts accounts receivable, really all it is is I send out emails. Here's your final invoice. Here's your payment link. Please pay us, sort of thing. Um, yeah, and that's just kind of what I do here. Accounts payable receivable. Also, I do this marketing thing. Right. So I do marketing and advertising for Ozark Fence. I also do the YouTube channel, stuff like that. So you that's say accounts payable as well. You say accounts payable, accounts payable yeah. and payroll. Yep. Yep. Wow. Yep. So, well, eh, I mean, it's not like when you look at it in terms of titles, it sounds like a lot, but it's really so here. All that's right. a lot. It, it is until you break it down. So I what was it? Profit first. Uh, uh, Mike McCowitz is profit first for contractors. He had a he had a gold nugget in there that he does accounts payable on the tenth and the twenty fifth. Period. They cut checks on the tenth and the twenty fifth. They transfer funds on tenth and so we've got we've got different bank account. We've got an income bank account. We've got a payroll, an opex, a, a profit, owners comp. We've got all these different bank accounts, right? So so at a glance, I can see exactly where we're at. But we only do transfers on the 10th and the 25th. We do billing on 10th and the 25th. So on my 10th and the 25th, my day is entering bills, cutting checks. 25th is entering bills, cutting checks, that sort of thing. So hmm. we break it down like that. Accounts payable gets a lot more manageable. But um, yeah. So anyway, but we're to the point of growing, right? So we do two and a half a year, two. Two to three hundred thousand of that is retail. Actually, this year it's going to be more than retail. It'll probably be five hundred thousand in retail this year, which means residential, commercial each do about a million a year, million, million to a year, uh, and that is absolutely the breaking point. Is yeah. that's what we're learning? Is it, it, for us now. I understand that other people out there might do more or do less. For us, with our system, that's just kind of what works. So break down that million dollars for residential. Is that an average sale of around thirty five hundred? Do you know what that is? Forty five hundred. Forty five hundred. It is just kind of what we kind of our average sale. Yeah. And then so is that five jobs a week? I mean, yeah. Oh well, again, depends on the size, but yeah, four to five a week. Five. So I'm just trying to quantify that for Sarah. So Sarah yeah. is managing all of those jobs plus the if you're looking at a 50% capture ratio on your sales, which yep. is really good, but yep. you guys could qualify. So you probably, that's another 10 contacts on top yep. of the five that she's working with. That's 15 customers, right? Say new sales and managing the contracts. That's 15. Uh, yeah, I can see that's, that's quite a lot to, to float through an entire week. It is, you know, and so, I, and I'll tell you where the pain point is for us is the communication, the ongoing communication with, because it's 15 this week, but we're also dealing with, so we're four to five weeks out right now on scheduling. So it's also for the last three weeks, the clients that we're coming up to this week, True. Yep. Keeping, keeping that communication line open because yep. there's questions that come up. Yep. Hey, it rained today. How does that affect me next week? Hey, the neighbor has dogs and they're concerned with the fence going away. What can we do about the dog? It's just like all yep. of all of the you know conversation that comes up throughout the process. Well, plus you don't close a lead in the full first week oftentimes. So she having right. to touch back those previous leads that she's working in the pipeline to yep. get that fifty percent cash ratio. So yeah. Um, and we try to automate that as much as possible. So through our CRM, so she'll she'll have a conversation. So the way our process works for those listening is, uh, so they start with our online quote tool. They use that as just a mandatory first step. They'll use the quote tool. They submit that information, and then they get a scheduling link for a phone call with Sarah for a mm -hmm. for a twenty like minute that. phone call. And then Sarah has a twenty minute phone call, learns more about the project. The thing is, guys. That when, by the time we get that information, so the customer uses the quote tool and they submit that information to us. Like that packet of information is pretty detailed, like it, and it's pretty pretty dead on as far as measurements go. It's like accurate two foot over a hundred or something like that. Like it's pretty close. For us, we're saving fuel, we're saving time. It makes sense. 
So the phone call is really to say, hey, I'm looking at this layout. It looks pretty straightforward. Is there something here I'm missing? Like, is there a new shed or does a neighbor have a new fence? Or is there something here that I just don't see? Give them the opportunity to say, well, okay, so what you don't see in that is, yeah, there's a new shed or we've redone some landscaping, things like that. Uh, yeah. After that phone call, then Sarah uh, puts together a proposal, which in our CRM, it's it's pretty straightforward. She enters the footage and then she breaks it down. I need this when you post rails, pickets. And then once you put in rails, it automatically says, okay, you need so many screws. Or after you put in pickets, it says, okay, you need so many nails. If you put in so many posts, you get so much concrete. Like it's automated to a certain extent. And then she emails the proposal off. Once she does that, it gets really automated. So after five days with no response, she can move it to a different bucket, the first follow-up bucket, and it automatically sends out an email. It says, hey, just want to touch base. Make sure you see the proposal. If you yep. have any questions, please let me know. And then on. So it's automated to a certain extent. And I think that's how we got this far. I was say, that's probably how you've gotten this far. You've and, done a great job. Well, we just made it work. Right, like that's just something, be, so Sarah's role, I used to do Sarah's role. I used to be in charge of residential. And so I was running a business and running residential. And doing, so I had to find ways to automate. Like I only have, and at that point I was working five 12 hour days, which that's brutal, right? And I get mm -hmm. it. I, I understand that some guys work more hours. Absolutely understand. For my family life, that was brutal. So let's automate. Let's get this to where it runs itself to a certain extent. So that's kind of how we how we got to where we're at now. But she is at capacity, right? In, in terms of follow up communication, in terms of project management. So that's where that's where you're that's where the conversation started when I called you and I said, hey, here's well, and and we've done some video chats back and forth with some other guys anyway. But that's where this conversation started. Was we need to grow. We can't grow. Right, like we're we're at the top of our deal. So that that's kind of the backstory on on how we got to today's conversation. But knowing what you know, Sean, what what do you think would be what what should I be looking at? You know, what should, what does my roadmap look like to you? Uh, it, it goes back to you know Sarah's wearing too many hats. That's yep. what we talked about before. Yep. Right, uh, you've used technology extremely well to get to where you are and that's going to benefit you moving forward. I wouldn't change hardly any of that. Uh, but having a, you know, for you, I wonder a project coordinator wouldn't be your best bet because Sarah is so good at those leads working in the face of the company. Um, you, you're probably better off hiring someone to work under her as a project coordinator and get that off her plate. So once she does the lead, it's done, sold, packaged, done, sold, delivered, Somebody else has to deal with the logistics and put up the fires, manage that piece. Um, I find that if you can become more efficient in the field, in other words, if you can get your team, your residential team there to build fence faster, um, that's really where the, the money is win and has, is won and loss is the, the hours it takes them to load the truck, unload the truck, get the raw material, go to the wrong job site. Job wasn't quite ready. Stuff was in the way. Yeah, I got you, Roger. I've seen that. Yep. Uh, but, I, but for us, that was where the turning point was. We were running ragged. We were doing a ton of work. But a ton of work doesn't mean you're going to make money. That just means you're going right. to probably lose more money because now you've exceeded your capacity of what you could manage with what we had available, which was me. I never really had a project coordinator. So once we moved to project coordinator position, that is somebody that their job is to manage projects, not people. Now, that's the key thing there to think about. Okay. It's not a project supervisor, okay? They're yeah. not the general manager, okay? Yeah. Uh, I've, I've worked with this for a while here to get this project coordinator. Their job is support the installation teams, not manage them necessarily. They're not right. their boss because right. you're going to have – if you if they're their boss, you're going to have this happening, right? Yeah. Uh, you really want them, their job is to manage the project. How do I get this project done as efficiently as possible? What can I do to make sure our team is catered to? I kind of use the words catered to, like yeah. treat, treat them like rock stars and movie stars. Yes, We're going to give them, look, you guys are fence builders. Like 
I get it. I used to think, well, you can unload your own truck and you can load your truck. Blah, blah, blah. You, you yeah. make me more money building fence. Yes, okay? sir. I can hire someone for less money an hour to unload that truck. Yep. So let's get past being stubborn and like, well, are you too good to unload your truck? Well, that's going to put – it's overtime. Bottom line, it's overtime. If they're unloading a truck, that's overtime on a Monday. Like that's what happens. Right. All those extra right. hours, the drive time. So getting to the job site and making sure that it's staked, like ready to rock and roll, I don't want them to find or figure out the problem. We really are trying to get our team, when they showed up, they're being catered to. Like the job is ready to go, like on a silver platter. Like here you go. You know, you're all oh my, you're, you're awesome. Here's your job. Yeah. And so that means the project coordinators got to go there probably like a few days prior because things change. Dirt work, grass, flies get moved, sheds get built. Yeah. <laughs> Talk to the homeowner one more time. Like you did want the fence right here, right? right? Well, Somebody, gates for us. Big one. The gate works right here, right? Now, and so what, what we try to do too, so Sarah on Friday, so she doesn't have any, any calls scheduled, no on-site scheduled. Friday is her... She goes to all the jobs starting the next week and puts flags out. Yeah. So that that gives the the homeowner the weekend to look at it, and say, okay, this looks right, right? But one thing we say is, I also put two flags right here, which is where your gate goes through. I want you to take your mower through that. I want you to take your wheelbarrow, whatever you think is going to go into this backyard. I want it to go in and out of that opening several times. Make sure it works. If it doesn't work, now is the best time to know that. Not when it goes up. You know, yep. now we can move it. We can move it over three or four. If it's a big open, we can move this thing over three foot. If that That's makes right. your life better, let's do it. But what we agree that needs to be figured out before your A team shows up. <laughs> right. Before the fence ninjas show up, you got to have that figured out. Right. Agreed. We don't need them figuring out the anomalies and got crew standing around. Wait, I want the first hole dug in 15 minutes. Like, let's go. Truck yeah. just showed up. He's on strapping. Co-formers digging a hole. Let's go. Like, yeah. Yeah. That's where the money's made and lost is that time it takes in the morning. You know, it's 830 in the morning. Okay, we got to figure it out. All right, let's go. Like, are you serious? Yep. I mean, <laughs> you could have all the post holes dug by then. Won a race. They, What's that? Race horses won a race. You yeah, know, that's, that's my guys get really frustrated when they show up and the gate, they, the gate's got to move. The, this guy, yep. he's like, I am here to build fence. That's right. I am a rock star building fence. I yeah. want to build, please let me build fence. That's right. You know? And so sometimes that gets us, I don't want to say in trouble, but sometimes they make, they rush decisions to get to building that fence. That's correct. You know, like, Hey, will it work here? Will can I just put the gate here? Will it work? And then the customer goes, okay, yeah, it'll work there. That's fine. But you know what I mean? But then that's the customer that calls after the project's done saying, ah, Change your I, mind. Really wish I, the, I, said, yeah. I really wish the gate would have been over there. Like, oh, no, yeah. Yeah. Race horses want to race. They do. And, and they need, need to give them the best foot forward. Yep. Give them the right information yep. uh, and try to get in front of those anomalies. It's not always just where the fence goes, but the environment. Sometimes you're better off. Sure. Do we need a piece of equipment out here? Can we use a piece of equipment out here? Want to figure that out before we get a crew there. Is yep. there utilities now in the way that we didn't know about the first time we were out here? Are the neighbors on board? Yeah. Like that's a big one. Yep. Yeah. Are there any concerns from the neighbors? Because and then we'll bring that, that up. That same person, their job is to make sure the material is physically there and ready. I can't tell you the number of times the crew's like, well, it's not out there. What do you mean it's not out there? I got an order form says right here, you delivered on da da da. And the order was wrong or missing a piece. So we didn't have eyes on it. Right making sure things are pulled in order and fabbed and ready to go. Uh, so material logistics, yep. project logistics are their job. Um, and then they're the first firefighter, right? So when there is something, we did all this planning, we laid it out, right? We had the job looked at, we got the material. I did everything perfect. Guess what? There's something going to happen. There's a change and someone needs a line post or someone needs an end post or someone needs this. That project coordinator is their job. Like find a way, either grab a salesman that's running by there already, take it yourself, figure it out. It'll be a two-day job, get when they get come back second time, uh, but fill that void. Sure. Uh, and make sure that team is continuing to move forward. I don't want to see a delay. So let, let me ask you, and I'll just here's our hesitation, right? It, there's always hesitations with everything, right? But here's ours with this. We have a competitor in our marketplace that has several layers of responsibility on a project, meaning that 
if if I'm buying a fence from you, then I deal with you, the salesman, and then you, the salesman, pass it off to production, that then passes it off to installation, that then passes it to several people. Well, I've only met you. So I'm calling Sean and I say, hey, Sean, where are we at on this? And you say, well, you know what? I don't know. I pass that off to Jim. Let me check with Jim. Let me forward you over to Jim. And Jim says, oh, you know what? In the last production meeting, I actually passed that off to the installation manager. Let me shoot you to him. And then the installation manager says, well, wait a minute. You know what I mean? It gets really frustrating from the client's perspective. So we capitalize on that. Like we we spend a fair amount of time saying, when you deal with those arc fence, you deal with Sarah. Yeah. And so that that's our hesitation. And let me give you my idea for that and see what you think. Our idea, and I say ours, because Sarah and I spend a lot of, we've spent the last few weeks seeing how this would work, but is bring an assistant role on for her that does project support, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So they still deal with Sarah. So if in this scenario, I call you and I say, hey, where are we at? And you say, that's a great, that's a great question. Let me check with my project support and then I'll get back with you. Does that make sense? I think that would work up until you get too busy again. And then you're like, yeah. okay, now Sarah can't handle that, right? So, yeah. uh, but I think there's some value in doing this. She sells a project and you have an expectation meeting with the client. Mrs. Jones has been great so far at this point. Mark is amazing, our amazing project coordinator. He's gonna walk you through the entire journey to the end. And this is how it's gonna look. And if you ever have an issue, I'm always here to help. But Mark's full-time job is to make sure your job is taken care of. Yep. I have other people I got to go out and take care of too and look at their new projects. But guess what? His only job is to take care of our current clients. And so once you make the introduction to him, Mark is your person. Your communication goes to Mark, whoever that person is, right? Yeah, right. Uh, and then so it's, it is Sarah's assistant. But we want to pass off that communication from Sarah yeah. to Mark. Okay, so. whoever a person is, right, right. Because we got to get that lump, we got to get that volume off of her plate so she can focus on growing. You're going to have to sell right. more jobs. You're going to talk to more people. You're going to have more projects. That's that's what we're talking about. Yep, yep. So we're hitting a max capacity now. She doesn't want to work 12 hour days. God bless yep. her. I wouldn't want to either. Yep. I don't blame her. Let's, yep. Let's, let's get past that. So yep. your project coordinator, you just have to make get in front of that relationship and make sure you educate your team. This is a great your customer. Yep. This is amazing. He is a super coordinator and his full-time job is to take care of you. He's going to see, make sure the crew does it exactly the way Sarah said it's going to be done to yep. our quality standards and our time frame. You can reach out to him at any point with scheduling questions. Yeah. yeah. So yes, that, so here's what just clicked was that, so we do, so in our flow, when you sign the contract and deposit, then we schedule an on-site consultation that where we actually put eyes on the project. We double check measurements. We do all that. I think that in your conversation just now, I think that's where that introduction happens. So the yep. project manager takes a trip out there with Sarah. So Sarah says, you know, in this in this example, this is Mark. So we, so Sarah says, hey, you know, Sean, it's so good to meet you in person. I've talked to you all this time. And it's super great to put a face with the name. I'd like to introduce you to Mark. Now, yep. Mark is my project management rock star. He makes right. sure everything gets done. I want him here because I want him involved in this whole thing because he's going to be your point of contact. He's going to, and then Mark hands a card. Here's my card. Here's all my contact information. But one thing here too. So, uh, so Tom Reber and the team over at CSA do what they call a transfer of trust, right? Where it's yep. now these exactly. guys are like remodelers where they're on a project for months or something, but they, but the sales brings in the project manager and the customer and basically the project manager regurgitates all of what the sales guys told them. He's like, all right, Mr. Customer, what I am hearing is we're doing this and we're doing that. We're doing this and we're this color, that sort of thing to let the customer know, okay, A, they're on the ball. They know exactly what I want, but it also gives the customer the chance to say, oh, okay. So we did talk about that, but yeah. really what I want is this, this, and this. Yep. But that way the project manager is in that conversation to know that. I think that's, I think that's exactly what we're talking about here in fencing. So I would take it in a step further and you right. talked about uh, the promotion you've been doing with Sarah is different than your competition because we don't hand it off. Right. right. I, would, I, I would capitalize on that and say, not only do we 
not just hand it off like everyone else and build these three different layers. We're, we actually have a dedicated project coordinator for your project. I would actually promote that you have a dedicated project. It's even better than having one person who does the sales and everything manage a project at Ozark Fence. We think that the, ex the experience of you buying a fence from us is so important that we're going to dedicate a team member. Their only job in life is to make sure your project goes off as best to our abilities as possible we can. Yeah. And so – you're, you're, yes, you're doing what the competition is just slightly, but super. you have a super person. You have a superman. Right. You have a project coordinator. Right. They have a da 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 they and to keep handing it off. We're not, we're not doing that. We are going to take it from we, our initial consultation. Now you have superman, project coordinator, Mark. It's going to yep. take your project all the way to the end and make sure that if we get done, we've exceeded your expectations for the whole journey and the finished product. I like it. <laughs> well, guys, we solved the world's issues right here. Um, no, that, that's exactly right, Sean. And this, so so guys, guys and gals at home, this is exactly this is exactly what I wanted to happen. I wanted us to talk through this to find this resolution, but have you guys be in on the conversation because I really believe there are, there are more folks out there that are in this scenario right. Right, that are ready to grow. Now for us, it's how do we get from 2.5 to five or something, you know what I mean? But this conversation could easily be, how can I get from a million to 2 million? Or how can I sure. get from 500,000 to a million? Whatever the scaling is, this, well, I, I really well, those would be a little different, right? So the 500 right. to a million might be a little different conversation. It probably wouldn't be a project coordinator at that point. No. But no. I, I do think you're right in that there is different levels where you've got to focus on different resources in your company overhead expenses because right. this project coordinator is an overhead expense at the end of the yeah. day. Right, right, and, right. And yeah. I often like to use this visual uh, overhead is like this chunk and revenues here. And generally with overhead, we we put overhead in first and then we're like, okay, we got to raise revenue, we're raise revenue, we're raise revenue. And then we get to the point where revenue is exceeding overhead capacity or yeah. red line in the company, which is Joe, where you are. Where here, we're at. Yes. Okay? yes that's so it. This is what happens. And then you're like, okay, we got to fix overhead to meet capacity. And you always do more. You don't just raise your capacity to right where you're at. So yeah. you go like this. You bring in a new project coordinator, right? So you got to agree to pay them for a year. That's a big chunk. Right. right. And then your revenue is going to grow. But there's a sweet spot right in here where the revenue is not maximizing the capacity of your overhead. That's where you make money at. That's a yep. sweet spot. Yep. Okay. But as right. soon as you want to get in the growth mode, revenue is going to exceed capacity of overhead. You're going to make that jump, Joe. Yep. You're getting ready to make that jump. Yeah. You're going to, your overhead's going to increase before your revenue does. Yep. And then, so you're going to, it's going to be tough to make money here. Yep. You're going to hit that sweet spot again. You got to decide: Do I want to hold here? Yeah. Make money. Yep. Or do I want to grow? The, yep. Growing isn't always the way to make more money, by right. any means at all. Right. Well. When you talk to guys, you know, I, I talk to guys that run huge fence companies. You know, there's there's a guy that out west that they do forty million a year in fence. And I was like, Man, how cool would that be? I said that too. I like it's cool to be you, buddy. I promise. He's like, uh, mm, I would almost <laughs> rather be you actually, because right. he goes, Because my day is spent with executive meetings. Like yeah. I'm a, I I work at a desk. Like my I'm an executive guy. I deal with the managers who then deal. I'm so disconnected from the guys that build fence. I want to get back to when I got to see these guys on a daily basis. So yeah. that I think that's to your point that that growth for the sake of growth may not always be the answer. Have an end goal. Know where you want to go. What does right. the finish line look like? What are we trying to get to? It's not just I want to get as big as bad as I possibly can. Eh, why? Yeah. Why, why right, do you right. want to do that? What is it that you don't have now that you think that's going to bring you? Yep. And let's really have a conversation about, will that really bring that to you? Do you have the capabilities? Do you have the experience? Do you have the knowledge? Do you have the resources to really pull off a $5 million company and be successful? At? Because I know sure. not everybody's going to be successful in that sort of size of a business. You, sure. It, it's not building fences. I can tell right. you what, at $5 million and you own that company, you're not building fence. Right. So you can be the baddest ass fence ninja out there and you think, oh, when you get to the five million dollars, I don't know of any guy at five million dollar revenue that's building a fence. So your experience with building fence 
has little or nothing to do with the success of your company. However, if you're good at managing people, you understand how to be a leader and a team member, and you understand business and numbers, you could probably be very successful. But that person is different than the one that was at a 500,000 that really knew how to run a, a build a fence. Does that make sense? Yeah. They're two different people. So yep. I often find that the guy that's a million dollars that wants to go to five million probably shouldn't because it's not him. Yep. You follow well, what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 absolutely. And, and it's not, and knowing your why isn't, to your point, is it because I want to make more money, right? When, who is it? It One, one of these moguls and these money moguls, their point is you don't want money. You want the things money can do. Absolutely. Like, no one wants to look at a bank account and go, oh, cool. I have so many commas. Yep. Like, so like that's a phone screen telling you, yep. no, no, you want what money can do. That's you right. want to go places that money can take you. You want to have experiences that money can buy you. That's what you want. So I, I like in that conversation to this conversation, know what, know what your why is. Absolutely. I don't want to make five million a year because I want to make five million a year. No, no. I want to do it because I want to grow our tribe, right? I want to be more impactful to more people and I can have a better impact on our community. We have we give a percentage of our revenue back to the community. So if we can grow the revenue, we can grow the give, right? So that's that's our why. But, but you also right. like running a company, right, Joe? You like running a company and not necessarily building fans. Yeah, that's true. That's right. absolutely true. And, and that's the reality of it. Is some guys just like getting after it and building fence. And that's an yep. owner operator and fence and ninjas. And we need those guys. 100%. Okay? We craft them. Yes. Right. But Absolutely. there's some guys that don't want any part of that. They would rather, uh, like I said to you earlier, it's like playing a video game. Mm -hmm. Running this business is like running playing a video game. You make decisions, put things in, put things in play. Did that work out? Did it not work out? You measure matrix. You understand results and say, well, let me try it this way. We try this. How do we get past this level? Yep. Next level. Just playing a video game. It's not necessarily building fence when you so, get over your levels. So, Sean, I really believe that's one of my uh, weaknesses. That's one of my faults is that I enjoy being a problem solver. Yeah. And the reason that's a fault is because if there aren't any problems, I create problems. You get There's distracted. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. It's like, um, having, a, it's like having a Labrador, Labrador Retriever. If you don't give that dog something to do, a problem to figure out, it will start creating its own habit, right? It will yeah. tear apart your house. It'll rip open the couches. It'll mark up the walls. Same sort of thing. Like that is absolutely my fault is that if there's not something here for me to work on, I'm going to make something for make me something. to work on. Right. You and I are really alike with that comes to that because I get distracted, shiny objects yep. swirl the other way. Yes, if sir. I'm not fully capacity, if I'm not at full capacity, if I have downtime, I'm already, I'm thinking of new tools, a better way of doing this, a new business, help it. I just can't stop. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so right. I got, I got to stay focused on something. Otherwise I'm going to stay it. focused on something else. That's it. I got it. Yeah. That's exactly what I was going to say. If I'm not focused and I'm looking around, I will find something to focus on. Yeah. And usually like, that's not exactly. a great experience for those around me. You know it's what I mean? Not. Like it's yeah. Anyway, that's, that's a very real thing for sure. But and all time. right. So let's catch up with some chat here. Um, all right. My salesman or geo draw would probably be recommended for broadening market as well. Qualified clients. Agreed. <coughs> Excuse me. I swallowed wrong. It's not a pandemic situation. Um, we, I love my salesman. I've used both. My preference is my salesman. Just my experience and my client's experience. There are guys out there that love geo draw. If it works for you and you enjoy it and your clients enjoy it, then that's what you should do. For us, my salesman works really well. Uh, Fly guy wants to know call center recommendations. Uh, we use pink collars. I know there's others out there. I don't have experience with them. Uh, Michelle Meyer runs a company called Pink Collars, and I, I like them a lot. It's a group of ladies, and I am a big fan of putting ladies in positions where it's it's what how do i want to say this it you know client experience positions right because here's the thing a lady is much more empathetic than i am right it's yeah. not saying nothing about nothing i'm just saying but people where the strengths are right True. i mean that's the thing so uh, and that's a broad stroke 
I get it. But pink collars is my recommendation. Jason Reed wants to know, do you pay your subcontractors by the foot? Also, do you deliver the materials to the site for the subs or they pick it up at your shop? Uh, in my instance, we do pay by the foot and they the contractors come pick up their own material. We've tried it the other way around. For whatever reason, there is always something, right? There's bolts that didn't get loaded or there's a job changes slightly, whatever. Our contractors like to load their own material that, yeah. that they know what's on the truck and because I'm going to hold them responsible for the project. Right. And so that we had this conversation a while ago and the contractor said, if you're holding me responsible, then I want to be responsible for the job. I want to load my material. I want to know what I have on and what I don't have on. I want to know he was more comfortable loading his own material. That's, that's absolutely fine. So yeah. in our experience, that's what works. I know other guys that they have a crew that all that crew does is deliver material so that, you know, Sean, to your point. So when the crew shows up, they're just there to build fence. They're not there to load material, not load material. So I, I would almost say this kind of varies by crew, right? Or by person or, or whomever. Uh, it's probably going to be a personal preference type thing. For us, it works better having them load it here. That way they know exactly what's there, what's not there, you know, all that. James Blydesdale says, what CRM do you use? I use Job Nimbus, but I'm learning it has some limitations in my industry. We use Job Nimbus as well. Um, Job Nimbus was created for the roofing industry, and they are they have since started tailoring it to additional industries, fencing being one of them. We started using Job Nimbus a couple years ago, and at that point, it was a roofing only. And I, I, James, I have the same opinion. It's a great CRM that has limitations. What I learned it, so we started using job limits a couple years ago, and then we jumped to another one, and then we jumped to another one, and then we jumped to another one. And what we learned is there is not a perfect one out there. Mm -mm. There's no not one yet. you're in. Not yet. Right. Correct. But job nimbus seems to check all the boxes for us. Uh, it is a learn there is a learning curve involved with it, right? Both on the office side and on the production side, there is a learning curve. I think that'll be with no matter what you do. Even if there is a perfect solution out there, there'll Agreed. still be a huge learning curve. Agreed. With that software. Yeah, to get everyone on the same page. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, James, to answer your question, we use Job Nimbus as well. I like it. I, I tell you the feature I like, just being behind the scenes guy, kind of guy, you can create a budget on day one. Like when the job is sold, here's our budget. If everything goes exactly right, here's our gross profit. And then after the project is done, you can do a follow up. We call them post mortems, but you can call them whatever you want. All right. It called for 26 posts. We actually used 27. Why did we use 27? How can we have that not happen again? It said we're going to use X amount of rails, X amount of pickets, X amount of labor. We yeah. use more or less. And when we're doing those, we have both production in the room and sales in the room. So both our or Scott, who's our wood crew foreman, is typically in the room. And then Sarah, who sold the project, is typically in there if we're doing a wood project, so that we can all have that conversation. And it's not it's not finger pointing, right? It's not oh well, if you would have sold it with enough foes. No, it's Sarah's usually the one saying, oh okay, so why why did we use yeah. what do I need to look for on the next one to make sure we have extra posts? That's the planning piece. Yep. Yep. Right, 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 absolutely. So, but in job Nimbus, you can create budgets. And then it's it's pretty seamless to create work orders and stuff like that. I like it. Uh, like I said, I've tried a lot of the other ones. Job Nimbus is the closest to what we need right now in the industry, I think. All right. Hey, Roger, thank you. I know I put this up before. Thanks for keeping us on track. Appreciate that. Yep. Will is right on the money. You need a project manager once it's sold. Absolutely agreed. James says this is great stuff. Thank you, James. That's exactly – that's why I wanted to do this on a live is so that you guys could be in the room or on the call or whatever you want to say during this. I think sure. it's better for Together us. we get better. That's right. That's right. Roger, thank you. I absolutely will. So there this is confusing. There are two will H's here. I thought this was the same comment until I realized picture's a little different. All right. But you're right. Project manager, project coordinator. Absolutely. That's going to be our next step. Um, even my oncologist has a coordinator point of contact outside of his 
PAs, nurses, and scheduler. If I have an issue or question, I hit up the coordinator who gives me the answer ASAP. Absolutely, fish and pick it. So I like that example. The example or, or the what what I think of is, so our insurance broker, actually he's a guy that I'm good friends with. We went to high school, I like him a lot. If I have an insurance question, I call his assistant, right? Because I know he's out in the middle of everything getting it done. That's right. And I know if I call Teresa, she can have an answer for me within five to 10 minutes. If I call and leave a voicemail for Blake, it might be this afternoon, right? So same thing. I tell my friends, don't call me, call my office. I'm yeah. going to be the, I'm going to be the bottleneck. Right. Exactly. That's exactly right. Great example. Fishing and picking. Brent Mitch is with us. Brent, welcome, buddy. I, this might be the first like Joe Evers YouTube or you're on Facebook. The first Joe Evers Facebook you've been on. So Brent and I, Sean, so Brent's from California. Brent and I have never met in our lives, but he and I are very good friends. You might call oh, us yeah. best friends. I do. I don't know if he does, but uh, yeah, no. So we, <laughs> all right, this guy sound nerdy, but we started out, uh, we met by playing um, what were, one of the war games on PlayStation. We were battle buddies. So oh, my God. Brent lives an adventurous life. He does uh, offshore fishing and all sorts of stuff. Brent, thank you. I do like the new rap as well. So those of you that follow uh, my personal channel or Ozark Fence, you saw that we got our truck wrapped orange chrome. I wonder where that idea came from. <laughs> um, Sean and I were chatting before, though, that it's been raining all week here. It's been just drizzly and nasty and overcast. I haven't got to see that thing in the sun yet, and I am excited for that. Cannon wants to know, yeah, he said, yes, is gold. When you add a person, is there an ex expectancy that each person should add X amount of revenue? So, hmm, that's a good question. I mean, they're going to be overhead. Right, so they don't, they don't directly contribute to. I don't yeah, know. but to off, but to offset it, there is a. Yeah, there so it had to be increased. You got this whole thing right here, so that sweet right. spot is what our expected revenue needs to be, to make up for it was a good decision to hire that person. Yeah. Otherwise, if we hire this person, have the increased revenue, but not, I'm sorry, increase overhead cost, but not increase revenue, then it really wasn't advantageous. We're going to lose less money. So there's a sweet spot. So what is it? It depends on the volume of your company. Like you hiring one more person at five or five million dollars, is it probably a different revenue increase than a guy hiring a, um, a person that does a million dollars? It's probably a difference in the additional revenue to offset that overhead expense. And it comes down to your percentage of your overhead of your total of, revenue. Of revenue. Right? Your total percentage. And so that percentage goes all the way through. So if you add, let's say your overhead expense is 30%, and you add hundred thousand dollars overhead. You got to do an additional workload to make that hundred thousand at thirty percent. So you take a hundred thousand divided by point three. It would tell you. Right, I'm sure you guys already know. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I'm doing something. Uh, like. Let's see if I could do that real quick. Uh, for the divided by point three would mean you, yeah, you have to do three hundred thirty thousand to hire somebody at hundred thousand. If your overhead's at thirty percent, so it's a calculation based on your overhead. Gotcha. Hey, Sean, let's watch this video real quick while I've got you. And then, guys, I'm gonna stay. I'm gonna stay on until uh, I'll stay on for a while yet. Still, okay. uh, but Sean's got a hard out. I want him. I want to get his critique on exactly where I went wrong in the video because <laughs> I know for a fact I did, and I get it. All right. Give me just a second. All right. Again, keep in mind, guys. I'm a fence guy, not a tech guy, but we're gonna give this a shot anyway. Mm, okay. I don't know how to bring me into this, so here we go. Maybe. Oh, but I'm Joe Everest, the fence expert, and this is how I laid out 90... Here, let me... Why don't you get me off the screen so we can see the whole thing? Yep, yep, yep. That's what I'm thinking here. Okay. Well, again, guys, fence guy, not that guy. All right. Feet of fence and well under five minutes. One of the most frequently asked questions I get on a regular basis is how we go about lining out our fences, how we do the layout, the markings, etc. So in today's video, I'm gonna show you how. Now, one important thing to note is this is not a paid promotion. We paid full price for this tool from Mr. Fence Tools. We are not getting compensated for the use of this video or for making this video. 
it's just a neat tool that we like to use a lot and it saves us a ton of time. Now, the first step is to obviously establish our corners. The first corner was easy. Jeremy knew he wanted to be 20 feet off the back corner of the building. It was as easy as measuring 20 feet. But how do we get to this corner? Well, to get to this corner, we got to back up a little bit. All right, so to establish the second corner, we need to figure out where 20 feet off of the building would be. It's as easy as using our eyeballs. So what we'll do is we'll line up our eye. I prefer my left eye with the corner of the building, looking for the other back corner. And as soon as it disappears, we know this is exactly in line with the building. We simply measured over 20 feet and we knew where our second corner was going to be. Now, the traditional way of laying out this fence line to know exactly where the post holes are to go would be to measure the entire distance and figure out how many sections we can get in here that are eight foot or less and then equally space out those sections. For example, this section is, or this line is 20 feet long. Well, we know we're on eight foot or less centers, so we need three sections. Well, 20 divided by three gives you 6.66 repeating. So we would have to convert that into inches and then lay everything out. Now, with the new tool for Mr. Fence Tools, the equalizer is as easy as figuring out we need three sections. We find our third tab on the equalizer, put a clip, and we simply stretch it out. Now, the way this tool works is an expandable cord. Think uh, bungee cord. So at maximum tautness, these tabs will be eight feet apart. But as you release slack of the equalizer, it makes sure that these tabs, every tab is equidistant. It makes sure all the spacings are proportional. We know we need three sections. So our carabiner goes on our third tab and then it gets placed onto our rod here. So now we know we've got three sections they're all equally spaced. They're going to be a little bit more than six and a half feet apart. Now, this section is going to be 70 feet. So we know we need nine sections equally spaced. We go to our 10th tab, simply start walking. Now, we're going to start stretching this out, and it's going to start evenly spacing each one of those tabs. Again, it's as easy as taking our last tab with a carabiner, clipping it on our pole. Now, what's a little bit different is Jeremy wants a four foot single gate to be right in this space. Well, that's as easy as taking a four foot span, carabiners on both sides, clipping one to our nearest post, our nearest tab, stretching our other carabiner over to our pole. Now we have a four foot opening and each post automatically recalculates its spacing to accommodate a four foot opening and then proportional post spacings beyond. All right, so one of the final steps in this process is gonna be mark out exactly where our posts are gonna go. Now, I'm using white paint. White is typically denotes proposed excavation. You see other guys use orange or pink. If they're digging that day, it probably doesn't matter. But for our purposes, this paint's gonna be here for a little while while Jeremy gets the equipment, brings it out, and gets everything dug. We want to avoid any and all confusion. This excavation will be done later, so we're going to use white. All right, guys, it really is that easy. It took me a little under five minutes to lay out 90 feet of fence proportionally with a four foot single gate in the fence line. It would have taken me at least twice that long with the 300 foot tape, doing the calculations to figure out even post spacings, measuring them out, and they probably wouldn't have been this accurate. If you guys would like to learn more about the tool, I've got a link in the description below. Again, this was not a paid promotion. I didn't receive any sort of funding. that bad okay it so, wasn't that bad actually i know i but like i'm i'm my own worst critic here and i absolutely anyway um i think we hit the height the high points right yeah you did a good job of explaining the cord expands right oftentimes right. we get people say well that's just a string line with marks on it like it doesn't how does that go that doesn't work and i'm like 
it's magic. There's GPS locators in every one of those tags. <laughs> they will instantly trust me. Right. To go do the math for you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That but, that's really what I wanted to get across is as that as that measurement changes, the posts automatically recalculate themselves right. to be to be exactly right. Well, and I didn't say that. So anyway, so I said nine nine sections. I grabbed the ten tab. What I didn't mention was there's a gate in there, right? Exactly. So you I, did well because as soon as you said, I was like, oh no, oh you got it. Because yeah. if you would have got the ninth tag, all those sections would have been maximized right. uh, pretty close. You wouldn't be able to fit the four foot in there. So when you add, add a gate in the line, you add a tag, and you put the gate spacer wherever you want. Yep. Um, Sometimes you don't have to add the tag if it's really like a bit, if you're six, 59 feet, okay, right. then you've got five feet extra before you hit 64 feet in all eight foot centers. Then you don't have to add a tag, you just put the gate spacer. But you'll know the cool thing about the tool is it will tell you if you got to add a tag. Because if you can't make the cord fit, add a tag. It's not going to fit. Yeah. It, we take the dumb out of building fence. I like how you didn't use any tape measures. It didn't right. matter, but it's all right. equally spaced. And it's a way for us to to uh, repeat here. You know, so the process of procedure is just repeatable and measurable and predictable. In other words, I can predict the results I'm going to get from the tool with the new guy in the trunk. Yeah. Right. Right. So I can take the mistakes out of the equation. I get guys who use tape measures and do math until they can't. It's all good until it's a problem. That's and right. now remark the line, whatever. So. Right. Well, and I mean, we've all been on that scenario in that scenario where you lay out the whole project and then a gate gets added. Like in my mind, like that's sure. one of the key points here is that, OK, well, that's fine. Well, Mr. Miss Customer, where would you like to get? You want it right there? No problem. Click, click, bring it, you know, bring it together. Like, how does that look? And now you don't have to rework your entire layout. Your yeah. project is still laid out. Right. You just now have a gate where the gate goes. So the thing that I would say is different. So that you need to look at in the future to improve upon. Yeah. Is I would not spray paint on the ground. We have no longer painting on the ground. We're no longer putting that string line up to set post to. So once we put the equalizer up, we dig right to that tag. Yeah. We set right to that tag. So we're saving the setup time of the stakes and the string lines. We're saving the paint. Okay. So yeah. So you'll just leave it up as you dig then. You'll just set the auger against it. Go. Well, we use our leg to push it out of the way. Right. But it okay. gives but when so you're a couple, setting. couple of things to think about when you're digging the hole, you get instant feedback. So let's say you're like, oh, man, that move, you can remove your leg and look at the cord like, oh, you got to walk it that way. Move the cord, yeah. drill. When you're done, you pull the bit out, you have instant feedback. You look at a hole and say, oh, I got that one. Or no, that one's off. We need to so when it. the guy comes behind you, one thing that we train on is own the hole. I use the word own it. Don't touch a hole unless you own it. So you've dug the hole. The guy come behind you to crumb out or clean out the dirt out of the hole. They are not to leave that hole until they own it. In other words, it's got to be perfectly in the right spot so we can set a post. How often do you put a post in a hole and then pull it back out of the hole yeah. because you got to crumb it over? So yep. that's that's those pennies we're talking about. We're saving right. pennies, right? Lift right. it up, take out the hole, get a bunch of pennies together to make dollars. So we want to make sure they own a hole. How can they own the hole? Well, they have an indicator. It tells them exactly yep. where the post is supposed to be. Check the hole, own the hole. When the post goes in, it's not going back out. Bingo. I like it a lot. So Kenny Redmond has a question here for you, Sean. Uh, what are the minimum maximum spans for the tool, for the equalizer? So, so the standard is an eight foot. You can order it eight foot on center. That means it maxes out about eight foot. Can a muscle man pull to eight one? Yeah, but you're going to know that you're pulling it past eight one. Okay. So it's gives you feedback. Like, you know, this is probably not right. Uh, we make them also for 10 foot centers for chain link and then for six foot centers uh, for aluminum. Oh, okay. Yep. Nice. Nice. What would you say the minimum span is? I don't know that I in laying so it out. So it's like uh, 40 foot. inches, depending okay. on if it's an eight footer or a six or a 10. Gotcha. Yeah, but I don't think you're really, I mean, could you use an eight foot one for a six foot? Uh, it, what he's saying is if you have an, yeah. you could. Yeah, it'll shrink yeah. down low enough to get a little bit less than six foot, five foot. But I think 40, 44 inches, somewhere in that range is the shortest span. Short. Okay. Good to know. Good to know. All right, let's get caught back up a little bit. So Roger's listening, so you can get from zero to 500. So Roger's in the very beginning. And and Roger, I still think this conversation, uh, re I think you can relate to this conversation just knowing that you, you have a destination in mind, right? Um, how does that go?
my daughter's school teaches me all sorts of stuff. Like, don't start your trip without a destination in mind, right? And they're they're talking about they're talking about like you know team building skills stuff like that in school. Like, don't start a problem until you know what solution you're looking for. But I, I think we should have the same the same mindset, right? That don't start a task until you you know what the roadmap looks like. So. Uh, Roger, I hope you're getting some value out of this. I think if nothing else, you can use this conversation just as kind of an indicator of what, where you're headed. Well, understand this work. This this overhead right. revenue is the same conversation at zero to five hundred to a million, ten million. I like it's this piece. I like your red line example. It's just like shifting gears, right? Yep. When, when you hit that, when you hit that max, you got to shift. Now, when you shift, yeah. you don't start out at full power, right? It, it's going to yeah. lug for a bit. Then it's going to get to the power band. That's the sweet spot. Off. That's yep. where you're making right. money. Right. Okay. Right. And then you got to decide, are you going to the next gear? Which means you're going to redline it. And then you're going to hit yep. the, the bog. Well, yep. and, and that is also knowing your destination. You know, like, is your yeah. goal to go 90 mile an hour? Well, if you're only going 65, you're going to have to switch gears. Like, you've got to right. catch another gear at least to get up there. Um all right. Big analogy show today. Big analogy show for <laughs> sure. Golden nuggets. That's right. That's right. So, so Mark's got a point. So we expect each person to add 200,000 in revenue at a minimum. So, so Mark, is that each? Yeah. Okay. That works out. Yeah. Yeah. He's saying, you know, you hire somebody, let's say you pay him a hundred grand. Yeah. Then that's like a fifty percent overhead, right? Yeah. Or if you hire someone you're paying fifty grand, and that's like it was a twenty five percent overhead. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So yep. you you want to make sure that when you hire the person that you don't exceed your overhead percentage. Yeah. Uh, for adding that uh, adding that asset to the overhead. You know, it's funny. It's funny. Like when I go to sleep, I forget things. So Mark and I literally did this when he was here, and I did the same thing. I did I did some quick math. I'm like, oh. It works out. I literally just did. So anyway, Mark, yeah. you got to see me do that twice because he did the same thing where I did the quick math. And I was like, um, yeah, that checks out. OK, well, good to know. Uh, Kenny Redmond says he's a software product, software product manager for outdoor living solutions with Simpson Strong Tie. Would love to talk to you sometime about a new product we're working on. Absolutely. Let me do this, Kenny. Let me drop my email address. And for anybody else, I'll drop it in the chat below. So it's going to be Joe at defenseexpert.show. There you go. Now, the dot show is important. I don't know who has defenseexpert.com, but whoever it is, let me know. I'll buy it. <laughs> I, tried to reach out, I tried to reach out privately through, like, GoDaddy, who is the registrar for that site. They're like, yeah, I don't know. It's the weirdest thing. You do know, like you're the registrar for the, they, anyway, okay. Aquaforce Services says, hey guys, this is Jeff with Aquaforce Fencing, looking for recommendations for strip type hog, hog ring pliers, Malco or DeWalt or, uh, Jeff, I'll be honest with you, wrong guys for the conversation. And the only reason being, neither one of us really specialize in agricultural type fencing. Uh, or, or chain commercial chain link. Maybe that's what he's talking about. Well, yeah, so we, I don't know. We use hog ring pliers on commercial chain link, but I'm not so I'm not so into weeds with that to know like brand recommendations. Yeah. Um, when they break, we call up a fence supplier and we say, "Hey, put on five more pairs of hog ring pliers." I'm, I'm maybe I should need maybe I should know more about that. I'm not sure. Um, whichever one our whichever, whichever one our wholesalers have. Is the ones we do. James Blaisdell's got a good question. So sales sales positions paid per hour or commission. If commission, what percentage of sales? So one guy, this is our deal here, right? So, and it's going to vary position to position or company to company. So, and also keep in mind, Sarah does project management as well. So project management and sales. I don't have anyone that's purely sales. She gets a salary plus commission. So the salary, you could say that the salary covers the project management portion, which like in dollars, it probably that's actually probably is exactly the way that breaks out. And then commission. Now I would challenge so commission, I would challenge you not to make commission a component of sales, make it a percentage of profit. 
right? Because that keeps everybody's eye on the correct ball. Yep. So if you're incentivizing someone to sell a bunch, but they don't, they're, but they're not making the correct margins, then what are we doing, right? So, so we do an hourly plus commission if it hits a certain gross margin. Yes, that, and that there's absolutely. a bottom line. So there's a minimum margin, right? So you say, hey, we want to make we're shooting for whatever fifty percent gross minimums forty or thirty five, like whatever your minimum is. Any it's got to meet forty percent, and then once you hit forty percent, it's a percentage of that of the profit. Yep. That way, you know, I mean, listen, stuff happens. Projects get out of control, whatever. Like I get it, but well, well we look at that and see was it some something that had. To uh, to do with them okay right. if right. it had nothing to do with them we 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 will pay it um, yeah yeah if they did everything right like if a crew made a mistake or there's a big error uh, outside of their fault so yep. we got to be practical with it so yeah. it's sure. a give and take yep absolutely but i i would do you know if it was purely sales only commission makes sense commission straight commission makes sense or an, an hourly plus commission makes sense but if we're talking about commission i would certainly make that a component of profit rather than a component of just revenue right. sales. Isoto says, I'm tearing down my old fence. Should I use the same post holes or do new ones? Depends. So it's going to depend on what spacing the old post at. Now, if it works out, you're golden, right? If if the measurement works out to where, you know, if it's eight foot or less on center, if you're doing wood, by all means, use them. Use them if you can. Yeah. Unfortunately, in, our, in the real world that I live in, like in our market, hardly ever does that work out. Right. Like, I don't understand it, but hardly ever do, do this, does the spacing work. I got about four minutes. Yep, absolutely. James says new holes. Uh, let's see. Matt Schaefer says hello. Good morning, gentlemen. Hey, Matt. Good morning, Matt. Um, yeah, they're going to skip through. There's some... Maybe maybe some nonsense comments in here. Oh yeah. yeah. All right. Would, all right. Such as I don't know if it, it maybe it's not nonsense. Is it against woodworking to read the Quran in the middle of work? If you're talking about fencing, if it's part of your religion, knock yourself out. If you need to read the Quran during the middle of the day, if you need to do your call to prayer, by all means, knock yourself out. Um, I agree, James. It is a great tool. Here's the thing. And here's why I stress, because I know this comment's coming up when we roll this video out here in you know a half hour. I understand dude, even though I said I'm not getting paid, I bought this tool that someone's gonna be like, Oh, no, I said, Oh, you did that because no, yeah. I did. I, so, I did a video on the tool because it's a great tool. I gotta share with you it's another gentleman, uh Nico. Nico, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, I probably didn't say that right. Uh, I've never met him in person. He bought the same tool. He's going to school to be an engineer. He runs a fence business to pay for a schooling. Yep. He owns the business. He bought the tool and did an engineering project for school on the efficiency of the tool over the method he was used to doing, which was measured out, do the math, straight down the ground, use the tape measure. He sent me this thing. I didn't even know he was doing it. All done. Hey, you got by the way, I got this uh, PowerPoint presentation, Excel data sheet, and a Word documentation talking about the efficiency. Joe, I was blown away. This thing was amazing. Yeah. He got a great grade in there. He proved in his engineering that it was 85% faster, more efficient for a trained person, and even, even more efficient for someone untrained on how to lay out a fit, 85%. And then he had data that it was 23.65% more accurate okay. than a trained person. He has all these data. He yeah. literally used a stopwatch and measured accuracy to every single hole for six months two different methods yeah. and has all this data analysis. And I'm like, and I didn't pay him. I didn't even know him from Adam. Right. So I did it for right. a grade, but I thought maybe you want to see this. So I'm like, I don't even know what to do with that content. Like, how do I share that to the world? Like, right, it's right, great, right. It's great I... stuff, but well, it really, really works. Yeah. We, we saw that in the video we watched last week of when you, when we were doing the fence school there in Nashville, yeah. where yeah. you did it. And then two guys that have never used the tool, granted trained guys, these are fence builders. Yep. Use the tool and it it saved it. I mean, granted, you use the tool, you invented the tool, so you're gonna know how to use it best. But these guys have never used the tool, 
and improve their time. I'm going to botch this, but it took them oh. what, like three and a half minutes to use a regular string line. And it took right. them down to what, like 33 seconds. 40, 40, yeah. Okay. 33 seconds. <laughs> One of them. Yeah. One did well, by himself. Right. Well, that's, that's the other thing. Yeah, it took two guys three minutes, or it took one guy thirty-three seconds. Yeah, and these are guys that that make a living. These are professional fence builders, yeah. right? And that. So anyway, but that's why yeah. I wanted. To, that's why. But no, I didn't even know you were doing this until you yeah. Facetimed me that day. I'm like, what, Joe? No, you do it this way because since <laughs> you did that, we've improved upon it. You you yeah. did it the way we yeah. used to do it. We yeah. used to do it exactly that way, paint on the ground. But this year, I've been, you know, kind of aha moment, made the gate spacers, string line, no tape mesh. Yeah. Yep. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and now we're all, I say we're all, the industry is moving towards like a driven post scenario yep. too, yep. which you would just leave it there for that. All right. So I see. I, I got to go. Yeah. The signal and Roger's taking care of us. Thanks. And Roger says, you're out. Yeah. <laughs> Roger. All right, guys. I'm out of here. Keep chatting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. All right. Bye-bye. Have a safe trip. All right, guys. Roger, thank you, buddy. Roger is keeping us on schedule, and he's reminding us, hit that thumbs up. Hit that like button. If you're watching this on Facebook, give it a like. If you're watching this on YouTube, give it a thumbs up. It, ha it really does help us with the algorithm on showing these, whether it's YouTube or whether it's Facebook, showing the platforms that we're making content that you guys enjoy watching. It helps me, and it's totally free. It's a free way of supporting the channel. It is how uh, is Stevie over at DNJ Projects. If you guys haven't checked out DNJ Projects, please go do that. There's some guys over in the UK doing some good fence work. They're also doing patios and decks and and uh, landscaping supply, like as far as gravel and sand. After watching that show, I never knew there were so many different types of sand. They cover. They carry quite a lot of them. Anyway. Thank you, Roger, for keeping us motivated and headed in the right direction. Dylan says he loves Simpson Strong Tie products. Absolutely. Simpson makes great products. And he says, can't beat the Titan bolts for all our flange bolts. Yeah, Simpson, I like Simpson stuff a lot. So I agree. Simpson, whether it's the Strong Ties or whether it's the bolts, great products. Kenny, you're very welcome. I appreciate you. I uh, appreciate the content you guys are providing by asking us these questions, giving us the opportunity to speak on whatever questions you have. We all learn together. We all get better together. That's the whole point of the channel. Absolutely. And you guys are part of that. So thank you. James Blaisdell says, thanks, Joe and Sean, for putting this out. Look forward to more great info. You're very welcome, James. Sean is an incredible guy as far as as having that mind to think through process to make sure you know make sure you're organized correctly make sure obviously with his tools that that you're getting things done efficiently um yeah i i i, I am one of sean's biggest fans absolutely so that's the fact that he takes time to come on is incredible i think uh but yeah so that's what we're trying to do here james is we're trying to make this as helpful for everybody james you're very welcome Cody Scroggins says, does it work for eight-foot fences? Yeah, absolutely. So um, so he had mentioned you can make it for, you can have it made for six-foot post spacings, uh, which is what we would do on an eight-foot fence in our area. Uh, you could probably, so Sean man, or Sean's company manufactures these, right? So uh, if you wanted a special order one, you could probably talk to him. I don't know about the process like that, but I mean, I'm sure you could at least have a conversation with him. But for eight foot fence, we post, we space our posts out on six foot centers, six foot or less centers, um, when we're proportionally spacing. So you can have one, you can order one standard with six foot spacing and use it for eight foot fence. Absolutely, guys. Let me go back up through the chat, make sure I'm not missing any of your guys' questions. If you guys have have any more questions, drop them in the comments below. We've got a few more minutes here. We got about oh I don't know about 15 minutes. Of course, if we go long, we go long, and I'm absolutely fine with that. All right, let's see. So we got Jim Beck's question. Yeah, so it's comments like this. I know we've talked about this with Sean, but I can't tell you how many people have this same experience that, that when they meet with Sean, like the way he thinks about things is absolutely phenomenal. So I agree. I mean, I mean, you guys watched it happen when he and I were chatting through what we're going to do with my company. And, and this is all real time, right? Like he and I, we had a conversation on the phone a week and a half ago when I asked him to come on today 
and I gave him the kind of the premise, right? And he knows my business. He and I chat before about what we're doing and how we do it. Uh, but yeah, so it's you guys, but you guys watch kind of the decision making process real time. So probably what I'll do is I'll probably do a follow up. I don't know, month or so. So we need to identify. We need to identify the position, which is what we've done. Next thing we need to do is to find the position, right? So we need to have job title, job duties, that sort of thing. We need to clearly define what the role is, what the expectations are. You know, what does it mean to win in this position? And then uh, we need to go fill the position. So I don't know. I'll, I'll keep you guys up to date as that process goes on. Uh, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Let's see. I just want to make sure. We'll make sure we are catching everyone's questions. Yeah, so I don't know if this is a real question or not, Terrence. Do you sell the cheapest wood stain thinner or petroleum? Uh, so they do make, so for oil-based stain, we use mineral spirits. If we're needing to thin it, we typically don't need to thin it. Uh, I'm not sure of the environmental implications of using diesel or petroleum. I have to think that that's probably a pretty massive no-no. All right. I think we're catching all of these. Sure enough, we got them all. I just want to make sure I'm not missing any of you guys. Uh, if you guys have a question that, you, that hasn't been answered, drop it in the comments below. Make sure I see it. But I think we're pretty well caught up. Bo Butler's with us. Welcome, Bo. What is your gross profit versus net profit percentage for your jobs? We're shooting to get 45%. Forty-five percent net profit on jobs. We have to hit sixty-seven percent gross on jobs. I'm curious how this lines up with yours. So, Bo, I don't, I don't know your business. I don't know how you run your numbers. Forty-five percent net profit is probably not. So, when we say net profit, I mean once every last penny's taken out, marketing, advertising, lights being on, building rent, you know, or mortgage in this case, or whatever. Uh, every last dime's taken out. So in the fencing industry, net profit of 10 to 15 percent is pretty standard. Uh, when we're talking to now, I guess for for like a small to mid-sized fence company, you know, larger fence companies actually deal on a little bit tighter net margins. So we shoot for 45 to 50 percent. We shoot for 50 percent gross profit. 45 percent, anything anywhere between 45 and 50 percent is acceptable. We shoot for 50. Sometimes we end up at 46, 47. Uh, net or gross profit to wind up at a brown, like right now, I want to say Friday's number is right around 12% net is where we're running year to date. So 45% net, I think we might be talking about two different two different sets of numbers here because 45% net profit would be fairly unheard of, uh, at least in the fencing industry. And like I said, net profit being Every last penny is taken out of that dollar, and that is pure profit, right? There's nothing left to be taken out as far as any sort of taxes, any sort of, you know, personal property tax, anything like that. Because um, I say personal property tax. That's something that a lot of people don't take into account. It's usually not a lot per year, but if you don't count it as, if you don't count it as overhead, it's still going to get taken out, right? So a lot of guys will pull from their profit accounts to pay taxes, which fairly defeats the purpose, right? So, guys, let me know what you thought about that equalizer tool. Um, I really do think it was a nice tool. Like I said, I bought it, paid full price. And Sean didn't know we were doing that video until after the video. I called and FaceTimed him. I was like, hey, let me let me just get some clarification. And I actually forget what prompted the call. I needed clarification for the intro. And I might not have even used the clarification in the intro because the intro was really just, we did 90 feet in under five minutes, and here's how. Uh and that was, and one thing I should have made a little bit more clear was that under five minutes included filming, right? I'm not a one take wonder here when we're filming, whether it's in here or whether it's in the field. Uh, few takes or few few takes were taken. Took a few takes to get that done. Uh, yeah, so about five, and it literally did take about five minutes, even when I stopped and had to redo it. 
And we filmed some B-roll and we did stuff like that. So I think all in, I think all in it might have been 15, 20 minutes, you know, B-roll and that sort of stuff. So, but anyway, that, that video that you just watched is going to be coming out here in the next, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. Uh, we're at 1220 right now. Of course, if you guys are, uh, if you guys are good, if you guys don't have any more questions, we can probably wrap this up early. I don't want you guys just to sit here and listen to me babble for a while. Uh, but if you do have questions, let me know in the chat below. Uh, but I'll be posting that here in a few minutes. What are the videos coming up, coming down the line? Very good question. We should really have, so ever since we moved here, we used to have a whiteboard like off the screen to where me and Jeremy, it was all in one room. So everything we had was in one room, right? So now in our YouTube studio, we've got like this room is the production room, I guess you'd call it, where all the lights and the cameras are. But then we've got a different room where we do like planning and keep all of all of the stuff we're not using, all the gear. So what videos are coming down the line? I know we've got we've got one video I just still need to do the voiceover on, uh, which is us setting up a home show booth, a trade show booth. Now this one was at actually this one was at a lawn and garden show. So what it looks like when we set up a booth, what I like to see in a trade show booth. Uh, we typically do pretty pretty big booths. So uh, this one was an eight foot deep by forty foot wide booth. Typically all the ones we do if it's a big show, if it's more than a one day show. So in our area, they're either one day shows or the three day shows. So they're either on Saturday or they're on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. For the three day three day shows, we do forty foot wide booths, uh, and they vary venue to venue whether they're eight foot by forty or ten foot by forty. But these this was an eight foot deep, forty foot wide booth. So it shows everything from us building the panels here on in the shop, uh, and then taking them out there, setting them up, laying the turf down, what it looks like when all the tents are up, that sort of thing. And then, uh, so we got that coming down the line. What else? Oh, I started a video a month or so ago on just outlining the different chain link fittings. Uh, we're going to use that one. I want to put it out there publicly. You know, what are the chain link fittings, that sort of thing. But we're going to use it. We're, we're really going to use it internally. So when we bring on a new team member, what's a brace band? What's a tension band? What's a tension bar? What's a loop top? What's a tie wire? Where do you use them? How many of them do you need? That sort of thing. Uh, so that's coming up down the line. And then I want to say we've got a reaction video. I have to double check on that. I want to say we've got at least one more reaction video. So uh, we've got a few more reaction videos to film as well. Uh, we're going to do one. So D home, uh, I always get this right, home renovation DIY. Uh, they had another video on building a fence. That I think we're going to do a reaction video too. Uh, and then we've got, guys, so... We are talking with David uh, last week in the chat from DNJ Projects, the guys from Nottingham. Uh, I want to do a reaction video with them. I, I also want to bring them on. So, guys, DNJ Projects, Projects, I want the projections. That's not quite right. DNJ Projects, if you watch this, uh, I sent you a reply email. It might have wound up in the spam folder. If it has, please check it out. I'd like to bring you guys on uh, just to talk about the differences in how you know, they build fence in the UK versus how we build fence here in the States. I um, also want to do a reaction video of some of their videos because those guys, one, do good work. And two, it's interesting to see how they use concrete posts rather than here in the States, we use either wood or steel posts. Uh, so it's kind of interesting to see how things are different. And I sure like to do that. So we've got that coming up. I'm trying to think if we got, oh, we're going to do a video on removing posts without, well, so the original video was, uh, basically like a no tool how well, was it no tool is basically like or no how to remove a fence post without digging right so it's a guy he used a high lift jack and uh, to pull up a post still doing well still gets a lot of feedback the biggest piece of feedback is the post didn't have a lot of concrete on it probably why it was getting pulled up in the first place but uh, we've got some posts here at the at the new location that we need to pull we need to get pulled up they had a fence around the front area here that we removed to make it Look a little bit nicer from the street and also look more approachable from uh, as you're driving in. But we got some posts we need pulled. So we're going to do a video on that. We're going to do a video. Uh, we're going in the video. We're going to use uh, we're going to use a jack, a jack system. So it's basically a dolly. Think of a two wheel hand dolly that you'd move boxes around with. Uh, it's basically like a big beefy version of that with a high lift jack that jacks the post up out of the ground. And then once you get them up out of the ground, it's on a dolly. Go straight on the trailer. Pretty slick little tool. We bought it, I want to say three years ago, four years ago at, uh, at AFA. 
I want to say is, I don't know, maybe AFA Phoenix uh, or FinTech Phoenix. So anyway, show that, probably get a dingo involved, show what it, because the number one piece of feedback was, oh, we would just use a dingo and all right, that's fine. We're going to show that. We also got forklift. We're going to, for, we got several posts to pull out of the ground. We're going to pull one out with a forklift. And then the, probably the biggest piece of feedback we got was hook a chain to your truck, run it over a wheel and just pull it out that way. Well, I've seen enough YouTube fail videos to know that's a great way to lose your back windshield, have the chain come in the truck with you. So well, what we're going to do is we're going to hook you up to the back of the forklift, pull that thing out with the forklift that way. And then maybe, and this, and this is probably not even a maybe, this is a long shot chance. But it's like 99% sure it's not going to happen, but there's that 1% chance that it could happen. Uh, a buddy of mine's got a crane truck. And so I don't know where, if he's in the, in, in state or out of state right now or what, but have a crane show up, pop a post out of the ground. I think that would be pretty cool. Anyway, that's a video concept we've got coming out. I'm excited about it. We've been trying to film it the last few weeks, but it has rained almost every day for the last few weeks. And unfortunately, so Tuesdays are our recording days, uh, on-site recording days. So we try to record all the content we can on Tuesdays. So that, that leaves me the rest of the days, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, to do fence stuff, right, to run the business. So the last two weeks... On Tuesdays, it's been raining. This Tuesday, again, they're calling for rain, so I don't know if we'll get it done this week or not. It's on the books. I'm trying to get to it. Mitchell, you're very welcome. I'm always happy to help. And it was good. I, I recognize the name and the picture. It was good meeting you in Nashville, sir. Yeah, we're trying to get some good content out here, Roger. If you guys have ideas for content, shoot them to me. Like I said, I've dropped my email in the comments below. It's joe at thefenceexpert.show. If you've got ideas for content that you'd like to see, shoot them to me. We'll see about adding them to the suggestions board. Give us good ideas for good content, and I would appreciate it. Will says you should do one for five-foot pool-type fence. Okay. I guess how to install it, maybe? Five-foot, three-rail. Trying to think if we've got any projects coming up. Uh, I don't know. We'll check it out. I know we got a six foot project coming up uh, for an HOA pool, uh, but specifically a five foot pool type fence. Very good. I'll add it to the board as soon as we're done. Gate fabrication is a great topic. Yeah. So, actually, Roger, so let's think about this. Gate fabrication is an interesting topic because, so coming up two weeks, two and a half weeks, up in Waverly, Nebraska. Empire Fence and Net is putting up one of the uh, AFA on the road fence trainings. Uh, and one of the modules is gate fabrication. So I would need to see, I want to say we're signed up for the Thursday, Friday uh, educational portion, which that's uh, chain link fencing. So we're all going to go learn a little bit about, a little bit more about chain link fence. Uh, I want to say Wednesday's gate fabrication. I'm not sure how early Wednesday I can get up there, but if I can get up there in time, so I would, one, one, I'm going just to view Empire's uh, setup. I hear a lot of great things about Empire Fence and Nets uh, setup, their building setup, how it's really efficient, specifically their, their fabrication shop. Uh, yeah, I'll take the video gear up there with me, and if, we, if, if I'm able to, we'll shoot some content on gate fabrication. Absolutely. Great point. Well, guys, I tell you what, I'm going to wrap this thing up. Again, I appreciate Sean for taking the time to come on. If you guys like more information on that quote tool, I think there, there should be a link. If you guys are watching me on YouTube, there should be a link in the description below to get to Mr. Fence Tools. He doesn't charge to come on. He does, he's You've seen how giving he is with his time and education. So I do him a favor, and I put his link in the comments below. I don't get compensated for it. It's my way of telling him thank you for coming on the show. If you'd like more information on the tools, click the link below. Uh, then if you guys are watching this on replay, if you have questions, drop those in the comments below. I always watch the comments. I try to be as quick as possible with the reply on the comments, but sometimes there's a lot of comments. As a matter of fact, I was looking this morning before I came on here. I think there's 20 or 30 comments from last night that I need to go reply to after this is done. Roger's absolutely right. Have a great weekend, everybody. And Roger, thank you. I appreciate you showing up, supporting the channel. 
If you guys know Roger, give him a high five for me. Pat him on the back. Tell him thank you and good job. Kasurik Distributors. I hope I always hope I say that. I apologize if I butchered that. I probably did. I really apologize. Thank you for showing up. Guys, have a great weekend. As always, I'm Joe Evers, the fence expert, reminding you that good fences make good neighbors. We'll see you next week.